So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much for being uh, with us uh, today and joining us in the ACP Secretariat for the briefing number 51 on agriculture as an engine of economic reconstruction and development in fragile countries. Thank you very much for the people who also follow uh, live this session. There are many. And as always, you can always uh, pose your comments or inputs uh, to, the, um, to the speakers. Uh, we are very happy, I mean, to uh, organize this briefing today, uh, specifically looking at some of the most fragile countries uh, in Africa. Uh, and when we said fragile for us, uh, it doesn't mean uh, only political or governance, but it means a, a, a combination of the factors which led to a very high uh, uh, and quite long term uh, fragility, conflict, governance, climate shocks, economic shocks, poverty. So we are specifically, depending of course on how you look at fragility, you could end up with a, a very long list of countries, if not most of, uh, of African ones. But what we have decided is really to look at the most fragile, uh, uh, as I said, along quite a long time. So uh, uh, Somalia, South Sudan, Burundi, uh, DRC, uh, Chad, etc. And of course you have the Afghanistans and other countries which are not part of the ACP. Um, and uh, we would like, of course, to see how uh, fragility affects agriculture, uh, but also how agriculture is part of the solution, uh, uh, because all these countries have a quite a large uh, agriculture sector, uh, and it's uh, de facto a part of the solution in the field, but how it could be taken up as part of more investment and more support, uh, be from the development uh, community, be from the uh, private sector. And of course, moving from humanitarian, which is still very important, humanitarian, humanitarian interventions to more sustainable development practices and, and uh, investment. Uh, and we are very glad that you know, we have people from the policy and development community side and from the practical pra practice and implementers in the field. Uh, specifically coming some of those from those countries like uh, Somalia, but also South Sudan, uh, DRC, Burundi, coming specifically my neighbor. So thank you very much for making that uh, effort and thank you very much for the development partners like WFP, FAO, World Bank Group to join us because all actors are important and all involved. So without uh, more delay, uh, just a word, but I think most of you are coming to all briefings, uh, or a big part of them. Uh, this is an initiative which we ran from 2007. Uh, I'm coordinating on behalf of the organizers who are the European Commission, uh, specifically DEFCO, the European uh, Development uh, Part, the ACP group, who always welcomes here very warmly, who stands for the group of African, Caribbean and Pacific states. And thank you very much, uh, Assistant Secretary General, again for welcoming us. And Concord, which is the, the platform platform of European um, NGOs, development NGOs across EU member states, and of course CTA, uh, represented by my director here. Um, so without a major um, you know, uh, delay, you will find all, all the information online, as always, including uh, not only the web streaming of today, but edited uh, uh, videos and further material uh, to uh, consult. Uh, I'm sure that the, the speakers as well will uh, just uh, um, uh, keep to their time in the interest of discussions and will help the chairs. Thank you, Bernard, for chairing the first session. Um, so without any delay, Mr. Vivanu Gnasunu, again, thank you very much for welcoming us in this important house here, uh, where you held uh, the committees of ambassadors, the ministerial meetings, and including some uh, heads of state uh, meetings in this same room. Um, you are the Assistant Secretary General in charge of uh, everything which is important, actually, for the agriculture sector. <laughs> Uh, for us, at least, I mean, uh, you know, commodities, trade, food security, uh, and so on, which is a combination of, of things which matter. But your background is not only expert on commodities and trade, so the, from the policy side, but also a successful uh, private sector, uh, you know, an entrepreneur, a private sector in uh, the ACP countries and uh, Togo in particular. Um, so thank you very much for uh, being with us, and uh, please. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Thank you very much, Isolina. Good morning to one and all. Once again, uh, we are delighted to welcome you here to ACP House, which is a house open to everyone. Uh, 
obviously we love hosting uh, meetings of this kind because it's a matter of exchanging views and uh, opinions uh, and uh, hear what you uh, have uh, to say. It's very good to exchange views because if you get bogged down in what you think is uh, something uh, certain, uh, then uh, you lose something. So it's always good to exchange views and opinions uh, and uh, reflect aloud on important matters. The matter at hand today is uh, something which uh, is dear to the heart of the ACP uh, group. Uh, we all know about fragility, or there are various uh, definitions of fragility, as uh, Isolina pointed out. We uh, try to have uh, as wide a definition as possible in the ACP group because we have states in a post-conflict situation. There is also fragility vis-à-vis -vis climate change. Uh, well, about a week ago, the Prime Minister of Fiji was uh, sitting where Bernard is sitting as a uh, president of COP23. He pointed out to us how proud they were in terms of the progress on the climate change talks, because if you're talking about uh, climate fragility, you have to consider seriously not only mitigation uh, and adaptation, uh, but uh, uh, the effects on uh, fragile uh, states. The World Bank uh, perhaps defines uh, fragility as uh, or fragile states as those states which are not in a position to uh, embark on a direct uh, poverty reducing uh, policies because of a lack of capacity. So it is a wide ranging definition there. It's a bit stricter in the OECD because this is more focused on uh, states in a post conflict situation. But uh, this is where our partnership with the EU comes into play. It's uh, a fragility where we try to include a number of uh, dimensions. About a year ago, we all know what happened in the Caribbean. In a few seconds, the entire economy of a country disappeared. In some countries, the, uh, all fishing, the fishing industry was uh, destroyed. And uh, the, because the coastal environment was destroyed. And uh, those countries used to be uh, middle income countries or categorized as middle income countries, but they were so fragile that they are no longer. So we will not come up with a hard and fast definition today, but we just have to see what solutions we can find. We, we can't be uh, all embracing, but. I think uh, our strength lies in the type of solution advocated. Such solutions should not be uh, limited to just uh, giving a boost to agriculture with a view to food and nutritional security, but it should also include uh, how to tackle the various institutions. Uh, you have cooperatives, agricultural cooperatives, uh, but you also have state institutions help uh, states to be in a position to have the necessary resources uh, in tackling uh, the problems in the agricultural world. And uh, so we have to see how we can uh, build those institutions or reinforce them if they already exist in order to tackle uh, problems uh, coming out of human behavior or natural disasters. Uh, today, we obviously will be seeking to have a range of solutions which would make it possible for us to have a toolbox which we can use uh, we hope we can use it uh, as uh, uh, as least as possible, but uh, we want uh, to also uh, be ready to uh, act when the time comes. 
to be forewarned, so to speak. We have to be uh, well prepared. How can uh, an insurance uh, system, which is not only uh, an institution, is also infrastructure to be built. If you're talking about uh, insurance, that is to anticipate uh, the effects of climate change, uh, see how climate is changing, how can you put in uh, place uh, measures uh, uh, to uh, tackle uh, those climate changes uh, before they happen? Now, obviously, we can't cover everything in just one morning. So your role is to try and uh, identify and pinpoint certain solutions, uh, the ones which are workable, and then we will be in, uh, in close cooperation with our partners in order to uh, see how uh, much we can put into this in terms of resources uh, so that the matter is tackled head on. Uh, obviously, my colleagues will probably go into figures, uh, etc. Our role this morning is just limited to welcoming you to ACP House. Uh, and uh, we wish you all success in your deliberations this morning. Once again, thank you all. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for emphasizing resilience and the need to anticipate events. I now give the floor to Mr. Bernard Ray, who is the Deputy Head of Unit uh, in uh, Europe, uh, DEVCO. He is responsible for rural development, food security, and nutrition. Mr. Ray probably knows everybody here in this room. And uh, through him, I'd like to thank uh, your colleagues who are my daily interlocutors, uh, and uh, they have always been effective uh, in their cooperation. Mr. Ray. Uh, has a research background. He was heavily involved in uh, research systems in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Africa, of course. You have been a field officer in many European Union delegations, Nigeria, Kenya, Madagascar, etc., before coming uh, back here to headquarters. You even coordinated the CADEP, the Development Partners. It's the African Union uh, uh, program for development of African uh, agriculture. You also have represented the European Commission in uh, International Research Center, CDIR. Uh, obviously, you uh, have a heavy timetable, just like Mr. Nyasunu, so thank you for being here with us today. Ms. Kainwas, thank you, Ivanu. Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, and to welcome you as well. And maybe just to stress in the first instance the key position of the fragility in the EU political framework. Because if you look at the consensus, which is the document establishing the policy of uh, development cooperation for the, commission, for, for the EU, uh, it will be ta development cooperation will be targeted where the need, and I'm quoting, is greatest and where it can have most impact, especially in least developed countries and in situations of fragility and conflict. So that really shows the importance it is. And in a year ago, the Commission uh, uh, published a, a communication or a strategic approach to resilience in the EU external action. And really, the, the, the key message of this communication was to stress uh, the need to move away from crisis containment to a, a more structural, long-term, non-linear approach to vulnerab vulnerabilities. And with, of course, an emphasis on prevention. But resilience, of course, uh, has been a, a topic of our interest over the last uh, years. Uh, in particular, the resilience to food crisis, establishing both resilience at various levels, state, communities, households, and thinking of the response. More and more we need to think that we have a set of uh, tools to respond, just like Vivanu was mentioning, uh, in, in a nexus which is around uh, 
uh, humanitarian, development, peace. It's really this, this complex which we have to address, which means that we need to mobilize a set of different uh, tools. But the question becomes, how, how do we choose? Well, how, which, which elements in these situations of fragility do we have? And this is why we have uh, really initiated the publishing, the publication of an annual report uh, on a global annual report on food crisis uh, to see the situation objectively based on the IPC uh, indicators of, with the Rome based agencies uh, and having something which gives us the possibility to discuss around the table with a various type of players uh, active in fragility context to discuss what are the best uh, possible answers and how to combine better the best uh, the, the tools that we have in our hands. We probably need to go further in having a typologies of situation of fragility because we know there is a, the climate change, some are human based, some are climate related. Uh, th th this is, uh, uh, and, and, and the way they express themselves is not always the same, so we need to understand them further. There is still work to be done, but this is an exercise which is very promising in a sort of a global network around food crisis. But it's also related and that's part of the discussion of today, and this is very interesting, is that we know that we have new tools and uh, uh, the, the way we support development uh, is, is changing. Uh, it is uh, thinking of creating decent jobs. It's uh, uh, growth in, uh, more in a total factor productivity matter, manner than purely uh, physical growth. It's de-risking investment, it's having a role of the private sector. So all of that, of course, raise particular questions in a situation of fragility. So really, uh, for me, uh, I think the two parts of, the, of this morning is, uh, is, uh, is quite clear. It is, uh, what does it mean, fragility, uh, for the agricultural sector? What is the, this articulation? And then what type of response? Do we have good responses? And we are going to have some good case, some studies. But really, at the end of the day, is how do we best uh, support fragile countries uh, with enabling conditions for a more sustainable food system? It's how can we f uh, best support also private sector investment in these fragile conditions? And uh, how do we balance the right tools? Because clearly, this is the fragility creates that the way we balance the various tools is not the same as the way we do it in non-fragile countries. And I think this is probably where, as development practitioners, we have a lot to exchange. With these words, I will thank you very much. I look forward to the discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. So uh, lastly, and thank you very much, uh, because I think everybody in this room and outside knows that the EU is the major development uh, you know, support partner in the world. So obviously, an, an heavy uh, in, uh, uh, investor uh, in terms of support to the fragile countries as well. So lastly, for this s short session on opening remarks, uh, my director, Michael Ailu, is director of uh, CTA, so the joint organization within the ACP and EU dealing with agriculture and rural development uh, since uh, 2010. Uh, based in Holland, you know that we are based in Wageningen in the Netherlands. We have a small office here, but uh, Mr. Ailu comes from uh, headquarters, Wageningen. Um, uh, and pre previously, um, before joining CTA, he worked extensively across the CGIR system, notably ECRAF and C4, just before joining us. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ailu, for being with us today. Thank you very much, Isolina, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be very short, uh, because I think most of the uh, settings have been uh, already, already made uh, by Vivano and Bernard. Uh, CTA organized uh, again you know, as part of these briefings in 2013 on resilience. So that's really very much related. It's actually a continuation of that discussion that we're having uh, today. So in the context of SDGs, of course, you know, the, you know, the issue of fragility is extremely important. Given that uh, a large number of uh, poor people, extremely poor people, live in 
uh, fragile states, and also uh, about 70% of those affected are women and, and children. So in terms of achieving the SDGs, you know, this is a critical issue that, that we have to talk about. And I think the focus should be on how do we build resilience. And when you look at from the perspective of agriculture, sustainable agriculture, and the climate challenges and so on, many of these issues are very much interrelated. So through our work, you know, we try to introduce, for example, climate smart uh, solutions, uh, innovations in ICT digitalization that uh, enable uh, farmers and uh, the agricultural community to respond to crisis and actually prepare before, uh, before crisis. So there are lots of interventions and uh, um, all of these are very much interrelated. So our work uh, from CTS perspective is very much on the long term sustainability, building the knowledge base, facilitating uh, exchange of uh, knowledge and experiences so that, you know, uh, we, we build sustainable agriculture. Again, agriculture uh, durable. <laughs> Et puis, uh, par rapport aux opportunités pour les jeunes, créer uh, des emplois, une subsistance, uh, une façon de gagner sa vie dans la chaîne de valeur agricole. Donc, euh, nous sommes très intéressés par ces discussions d'aujourd'hui, essayer de faire en sorte que les leçons puissent être tirées dans les pays, pas que fragiles d'ailleurs, car beaucoup de pays sont à différents stades. Certains, malheureusement, euh, deviennent des états fragiles, avec un environnement de moins en moins sûr. Donc, il est important de tirer les leçons et de partager euh, ce cadre euh, des politiques déployées pour s'en inspirer. Donc merci aux intervenants et nous allons voir le cadre théorique, mais aussi voir quelles leçons on peut tirer pour chacun des pays. C'est le modèle qu'on utilise hein, dans les briefings de Bruxelles, avoir un aperçu global des problèmes, voir les leçons qu'on voit dans la recherche et les études, mais aussi avoir, pour étayer tout cela, des exemples concrets des différents pays. Et les discussions d'aujourd'hui vont suivre le même schéma. Donc pour la première partie, nous allons entendre le cadre théorique et certaines des leçons globales. Et puis après, on rentrera dans le menu détail pour la deuxième session. En tout cas, les discussions devraient être très intéressantes. Merci bien, Bernard. Bernard s'est vu confier la tâche de présider le premier panel. Thank you, Isolina. Euh... Merci Isolina. Nous avons trois intervenants pour cette session. Alors vous avez dans les phares dans le CV des intervenants. Donc je vous fais l'économie euh, du CV des intervenants quand je l'ai présenté, mais en tout cas, je suis très heureux d'avoir euh, James Putzel ici. Ah pardon, il, était, il joue, regardez, je vous cherchais à droite, mais non, vous êtes à gauche. Vous étiez là-bas tout à l'heure, non Ah d'accord, oui, j'ai tourné la tête du bon côté, mais c'est vous qui avez changé de place. Vous venez de la London School of Economics, et vous travaillez plus particulièrement sur les états fragiles, et les situations de crise dans les pays en développement ces dernières années. Donc nous sommes tout oui pour que vous nous disiez ce que nous avons appris. Merci bien. Et voilà, alors parler en 10 minutes de 12 ans de recherche, évidemment, ça n'est pas facile. Donc, simplement quelques petites choses. D'abord, je remercie le CTA de m'avoir invité. J'ai fait toute ma carrière dans l'agriculture, euh, question de changement agraire. Et maintenant, je dirige un centre de recherche qui... Euh, s'intéresse à ces questions de fragilité, qui a défini la fragilité à l'époque en Asie, Afrique, Amérique latine, avec des partenaires de recherche dans le Sud. Est-ce qu'on va afficher à l'écran mes transparents Oui, très bien. Moi, j'ai beaucoup trop de transparents, donc je vais les passer en revue au pas de charge. Il y a un petit document dans vos fardes hein, qui s'appelle « Des réponses plus efficaces à la fragilité des États » qui synthétise certains des aspects principaux. Alors je pense que vous vouliez que je vous parle un petit peu de ce qu'on a retiré comme leçon concernant la fragilité. Avant, attendez voir, 
Ah oui, on m'a dit d'utiliser ça, donc voilà. Voilà, les transparents, ça couvre ça. Vous pourrez regarder les transparents de nouveau. Euh, il y a une version imprimée des transparents, je pense. Donc vous pourrez les viser, mais ce que je voulais dire, c'est que il y a quelque chose de très important et qui nous ramène aux propos liminaires aujourd'hui. Qu'avons-nous constaté que la fragilité des États, ça n'est pas synonyme absolu de pauvreté. Ça ne veut pas dire sous-développement extrême. Pour autant, dans la majeure partie des agences de développement, c'est traité ainsi, la fragilité, historiquement. Et il y a des problèmes liés à cela. Et euh, s'il y avait une chose à dire, c'est qu'il est important de comprendre la fragilité de l'État comme une vulnérabilité à la violence, et de voir les particularités de cela. Quand je parle, je ne parle pas du fait que ça pourrait être significatif pour les bailleurs de fonds, pour les agences, non, aussi pour les dirigeants des pays, ou ceux qui souhaitent être élus dans les pays en développement, dans les pays ACP, euh, donc les élus et ceux qui le seront un jour. Ça, c'est un aimant tout à fait essentiel, vulnérabilité à la violence. Et puis, euh, j'apprécie que cette euh, réunion s'intéresse aux situations les plus fragiles. Et effectivement, ce sont euh, ces situations qui sont les plus synonymes de vulnérabilité à la violence dans la perspective. Et j'apprécie qu'on fasse ce travail autour de l'agriculture, parce que à compter de 1980, et pendant deux décennies, deux décennies, il y a eu un déclin du secteur productif, et notamment de l'agriculture. Alors la tendance commence à s'inverser, mais voilà, il est important de se concentrer effectivement sur l'agriculture. Mais l'agriculture fait partie de la situation de fragilité, mais il faut voir ce qu'il y a de spécifique à l'agriculture dans la fragilité. Parce que l'agriculture, souvent, est la solution en termes de développement pour beaucoup de pays. Et il y a des questions spécifiques, des problèmes spécifiques liés à l'intervention humanitaire, où l'intervention agricole peut être importante pour ce qui est de l'aide humanitaire. Il y a des questions spécifiques qui concernent les changements climatiques, qui sont tout à fait primordiales. Et puis, il y a des questions qui sont la question de savoir comment on fait l'agriculture en situation de guerre. Voilà, autant de choses qui sont importantes, mais parfois, tout mettre dans le même chapeau, sous le même titre « problème », ça n'aide pas. Donc la fragilité, ça concerne la politique, à mains égards. Si on comprend les moteurs de la fragilité, les moteurs domestiques, et moi je dirais que c'est les problèmes d'organisation politique propres au pays, qui constituent le principal moteur de fragilité, le problème de l'exclusion des gens, des règlements autour de l'organisation de l'État, inégalité de traitement selon l'ethnie ou l'identité régionale, voilà les choses qui aboutissent à la vulnérabilité à la violence. Donc, les réponses agricoles doivent prendre en compte ces problèmes-ci quand on euh, souhaite s'attaquer à la question de la fragilité de l'État. Voilà, si je devais faire euh, télégraphique, ce que je dirais. Et puis, voilà. Alors voilà, tout ça, évidemment, ça s'est imposé sur la scène. Cette notion de la fragilité de l'État, ça a été une, un problème de sécurité, de sûreté. C'est les attentats du 11 septembre. Et ça, ça a entraîné un gros changement dans les deux développements, car jusque-là, les agences d'aide au développement se concentraient sur ceux qui s'en tiraient bien, ceux qui enregistraient des progrès de gouvernance. Donc l'aide a diminué pendant toutes les années 90 dans l'Afrique subsaharienne pour les pays qui en avaient le plus besoin. Et ça, ça a eu un impact important pour ce qui est de faire parvenir l'aide à ceux qui en ont le plus besoin, les pays les plus pauvres, et notamment pour les pays d'Afrique subsaharienne, et puis remettre à l'ordre du jour, du développement, la question de l'État, de l'édification de l'État et du renforcement des capacités de l'État. Donc vous avez ce petit document hein, qui parle des problèmes et de la façon dont on a défini la fragilité. Pendant longtemps, hein, le... L'OCDE a défini la fragilité comme tout, finalement. Hein. 
C'était un sous-développement extrême, finalement. Voilà, j'ai mis ça à l'écran. La définition, bon, je ne vous la euh, lis pas par le menu. But, you know, it was, it was thought notionally uh, and then actually embedded in most of the reporting on state fragility that countries that fall below 3.2 on the uh, CPIA index, which was actually devised as a tool, an effective tool actually, for allocating development aid in the, in the IDA at the, at the bank, um, anything below 3.2 was a fragile state. And the big problem with this, for instance, is illustrated by Mali. So Mali, for years, fell above 3.2, until the year when Mali collapsed in the face of the uprising and the violence, and the whole northern part of the country was lost to uh, insurgents, okay? And we could talk in more detail during the discussion about Mali. I'll come back to it uh, just really briefly. Um, how many more minutes do I have? Four. Four. Okay, all right. So, um, big issue is that many poor countries actually have avoided civil war. So more than half the countries in sub-Saharan Africa um, avoided civil war over time. And um, the, let me go get beyond this. And if we look at two of the countries we studied in great detail were Tanzania and Zambia, very low on the human development index. Uh, and still, the, these scores, if anything, have gotten worse for the countries I've listed here, except for Ghana, which has improved. So the point is that if fragility is not equal to extreme poverty, what is it about? And I think it really is important to recognize that. You can get great, the interesting thing to ask about Tanzania is not why did it stay so poor for so long, but why was it so peaceful? Why was it so peaceful? And I think we can learn a lot about fragility by looking at what has been resilience. And that's what's been lacking in most of our discussion. Okay, so let me, Let me kind of very quickly scroll to the end because I don't have a lot of time. You can look through this and you can ask me questions um, about it. I, what does all this mean? Once recognizing that fragility is something distinct, what does it mean in terms of agriculture? Okay, You'll see if you go through my slides that I recognize the OECD has changed its definition of fragility. The, You um, at the CTA have been using that new OECD definition, but I would say while it recognizes vulnerability to violence now more than it did before, it's still everything. Everything contributes. There's so many risk factors contributing to fragility that we can fold in everything. So I think there's still a problem in the framework. So if we see that um, uh, we should move away from this kind of all good things and all bad things go together. If you're poor, you're also extremely um, poverty-stricken, extremely vulnerable to climate change, et cetera, et cetera. If we move away from, from these kind of, oops, somebody help me, okay, there. And we, we have an idea that there's a different approach to fragility. What came out of our work where the, there, there are four really key dimensions around which fra fragile uh, countries move more towards fragility and more towards resilience. One has to do with security. The second has to do with the territorial reach of the organizations of the state. The third has to do with the fiscal activity of the state. Not so much how, how good is the tax take, because that's a developmental issue. But is the state the one who taxes, or are there many sources of taxation. And the other side of the fiscal coin, does the state or aid projects, for instance, spend in ways that reduce horizontal inequalities? In other words, the inequalities that are defined by, by uh, ethnic group 
regional group or religious group, or does it increase those inequalities, reinforce those inequalities? And the, and the, um, and the fourth issue, back to my slides, please, so I can, oh, they're here, are they here? Um, um, sorry. All right, this is coming on to where I want to be anyway. Um, and, and the fourth dimension of fragility has to do with whether the state's institutions are hegemonic or are there many different rival rule systems. Because when there are different rival rule systems, that means tribal rules or warlords rules or religious rules that trump the state's rules, people organize actions, legitimate actions in terms of those rules. So for us, this more parsimonious approach to understanding the spectrum that states move, they're not, we shouldn't try to put states in a typology, but are they moving to become more fragile, more resilient? It's around those issues. So what might that mean in relationship to agricultural policy? Okay. So I think this is where, you know, maybe it makes a difference for this, for our discussions today. Um, so this would mean that when allocating state spending, if you are those who are acting in control of the budget of a, of, of a given developing country, one takes account of the regions, the regional pattern of spending on agriculture. When you're thinking about the allocation of aid projects, one looks at, well, in the end, is this allocation reducing or increasing horizontal inequalities? That's the fragility issue about the agricultural projects. There's all sorts of other issues about empowering the poor, reducing vulnerability to climate change, et cetera, that one wants to think about. But that's the issue that provokes vulnerability to violence the most, okay? Um, when we're looking at questions of agricultural and rural policies, for many decades, the discourse has been about integrating into the international economy. The fragility problematic really needs to focus on how do projects, interventions, et cetera, promote internal economic integration. I think that's evident in some of what you've written and some of the projects you're doing from the CTA. Uh, so in other words, one's looking at the link between um, uh, farmers and urban areas. One's lo looking at the farm to market roads, the access to, 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 to to, to markets and the balance between production of staples and other commercial crops becomes extremely important here. Um, internal economic integration is the important thing that has, you know, um, been lacking in many countries that are vulnerable to violence. Um, the third has to do with encouraging state capacity. There's a very big kind of bit of our work that looked at the problem that uh, some others, like the current president, sitting president of, of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, had looked at the problems of creating a dual public authority in the delivery of aid and aid programs. In other words, many donors are going outside state systems to be effective, to get aid right down to the communities. But very often, channeling aid that way in the most fragile places creates alternative centers of authority that can challenge and do challenge the state or preempt state systems from developing. So there's a lot of experience of even with weak states or states that are suffering from fragility, we're working with state systems to deliver programs, getting aid on budget. In the long term, this is going to be very important to countering fragility. And it means that aid and aid projects and agricultural assistance will not always be based on issues of what is most efficient, what is most effective in production and productivity terms. So this is where it makes a real difference to say you're recognizing state fragility. When it comes to land, and you know, a lot of my own work has been on land reform and land redistribution as a matter of both social justice and as a matter of economic development. But land policies and situations fragility have to consider some other issues. They really have to consider the extent to which there is elite buy-in into the state. So one of the places I, I, I've studied a lot is Mindanao in the southern Philippines. 
And there, you know, the land reform that was being promoted in other parts of the country couldn't be promoted as part of the peace process in Mindanao because it would alienate the, the moral elites and, and contribute to aggravating the continued conflict and war. So issues of land become important on the other side when land was a driving factor for why people uh, took up arms or got into conflict. Then it has to be really at the top of the agenda even if it means certain ineffective uh, production. And, and, and finally, just two other points. Um, policies related to fragility need to think not only about poverty reduction, but pro possibilities for wealth creation. If we're going to buy, in, if elites are going to buy into the state project, then there has to be concern about how elites across ethnic and identity groups can partake and participate and gain from what you're promoting in agriculture. And in the end, it means that addressing fragility specifically might mean quite a different approach under this SDG2 in terms of agricultural development than it would mean in general in more resilient places. That's essentially the essence of what I wanted to say. Thank you. No, 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 now, back down to the other. Thank you, James. Uh, merci de d'avoir insisté sur ces différences de notions qui sont très importantes pour clarifier le débat aujourd'hui, et, et d'avoir aussi insisté sur euh, l'attention qu'il fallait me porter aux inégalités. Je crois qu'on a aujourd'hui un débat sur ces questions des inégalités grandissant. Et je pense que vous nous l'avez parfaitement expliqué. Plaisir de donner la parole à Rajendra Arial, qui vient de la, du service de la FAO sur la résilience. Et euh, riche de son expérience euh, en Asie, en Afrique, euh, il va traiter de cette question essentielle euh, du nexus entre l'humanitaire, le développement et la paix dans les situations de fragilité et de voir comment on peut construire. Rajendra, vous avez la parole. Merci. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, I will try to present things from the field. As FAO, I have been working in the field for the last 24 years, running from one crisis to the other. And Bernard, I really loved your questions at the end of your presentation. Maybe we'll try to bring some food for thought to address those questions, because these are practical challenges that we face on a day-to-day basis. I'll start with the, the slides, please. OK, I'll start with the state of food security, the SOFI report of 2017. If you look at the curve, around 2000, we were like you know 900 million hungry people suffering from chronic hunger. And thanks to the efforts made by the international community, different donors, different partners, the figure went down. So by 2014, 2015, it was really you know, below even 700 million. And now if you look at the train as of the report, as of 2016, the 2017 report says that 815 million are, people are uh, suffering from chronic hunger. And same with the undernutrition. And 60% of these people are living in conflict-affected countries. As we can see from the, uh, from the graph, about 500 million people are living there. Out of that, 125 million people are, people are suffering from acute hunger. And this 124 million, actually, some of them also lie outside the sphere of this 1840, 815. Meaning that like they are vulnerable and even a small state of shock could push them into another state. This is based on IPC, the cadre harmonizer phase three. I'm sure people are uh, aware of this integrated phase classification. 2040, the, the global report on food crisis, uh, Bernard mentioned about it. I'll come to it later. Uh, this was a real joint effort, which is now in place for the last three years. As per the report, 20, 45 countries were analyzed. And now there's an increase of 11 million people. Actually, it started with 80 million. 
It went to 109 million, and now the latest report says 124 million. Actually, the number of countries were also increased. Like from 45, it went to 51, but still, only in the 45 countries analyzed over a period of three years, 45, uh, uh, 11 million people have increased. Out of that, 52 million people under malnutrition, and 17 million people children are severely malnourished, uh, uh, severely malnourished. And then as we heard also from the speakers in the past, there are several uh, causes, outbreaks and intensified conflict, insecurity, the conflicts in Yemen, Northeast Nigeria, DRC, South Sudan, and last year probably you heard about these four countries, one famine, South Sudan, Yemen, Somalia, Northeast Nigeria. In addition, there are also climate shocks. Uh, Assistant Secretary General Liu talked about the climate change, the effects of climate change in different states. This is also driving a lot of people out of their homeland. Just, uh, what's happening? Okay, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. I mean, if you look at South Sudan and if you look at the graph, from the time the conflict started, end of 2013, early 2014, and I was based in South Sudan, and I could see how this, you know, the, the state of food insecurity has increased. And if you see this red uh, spots, you know, these are the phase three, IPC phase three classification. And probably you remember last year, Unity State was even declared as famine. I don't want to go into the details. You have the presentations with the figures. This is just an example, and then since I was involved in this, <laughs> I, could, I could talk about it. Again, coming back to this global report on food crisis, the outlook for 2018, it also doesn't look really great. I mean, if you see the countries like Afghanistan, Yemen, Afghanistan is a country, uh, uh, Yemen has like more than 10 million people. Under chronic, we have Afghanistan, between five and nine million, and also there are other countries. And you could also see some countries in Asia, like they are not very much at alert level, but these are the countries under consideration and under watch. But why agriculture? Why agriculture is important? Out of the 124 million people that, that are, they are suffering from severe food insecurity, majority of them live in the rural areas. Eight of 10 people rely on crop production, subsistence farming, fishing, livestock, and forest for their survival. And they are always the most vulnerable people. They are always <clears throat> the people who are so vulnerable to external shocks. And they are almost like they are the ones who are standing on the edge of the cliff. And even a small shock could, you know, let them fall off the cliff. And it is important. It's not okay. Humanitarian support is needed, yes. But why we need to invest in agriculture is because agriculture is resilient. Agriculture helps these people come out of that situation, slowly revert back to the normal way, uh, life, uh, normal way of livelihood. And, and we talked about, Bernard, I think you mentioned, like, how can we even invest in agriculture in the war situation? I think Syria is a very good case study. Syria produced 4.1 million metric ton of wheat in normal situation before the conflict. And now, after the seven years of conflict, Syria is still producing two million metric ton of food. And these are the people who are living still behind. They are, they are working. They are working in the field, despite the displacement, despite the damages in agriculture sector, the loss of seed stock, loss of food stock, damages to the irrigation canals. So that means if we try to do something sincerely, this could help. This is working. Of course, there are external factors. Agriculture also contributes to sustaining peace. The example I would like to give is from Abe in South Sudan, when the Miserias, they are coming from the north and the Dinkas are going from the south, and they go with their livestock grazing. And there is always conflict on natural resources, on water, on pasture land. FAO, thanks to the European Union, we introduced a project on vaccination. Started vaccinating the animals, but that was just an entry point. That was a point when both these communities came together and started having a dialogue. And that helped. That helped minimize the conflict. You mentioned, James, about Mindanao. Mindanao has been affected for I don't know how many years. I was also involved there from the program planning till implementation up to 2014. I was supporting also Mindanao. 
And we supported the people in Jambuanga. Actually, FAO and ILO, we developed a project together, supported uh, these displaced farmers, especially the fishers, on seaweed production, the women on mushroom production. We replaced the fishing gears. And that worked. And on top of that, another element in this type of countries, I can give also examples from Afghanistan or Pakistan. You know, when the people are displaced, when they live in the displaced areas or camps, and if they are not provided with any work, anything can happen. I, I recall an example from Pakistan. When Taliban uh, attacked uh, uh, Sawat Valley, there was a displacement. A lot of people were living along the camps in Peshawar. I visited one of the camps and met some of the farmers. They were uh, apple growers and uh, pomegranate growers. They were pretty like medium to big uh, orchard owners. And they were living in the tents, 42 degrees Celsius, doing nothing. And they said, listen, our young people are getting spoiled. Do something. And then we facilitated distribution of small packs of seed and some watering cans and all. And I later went and talked to that gentleman, and he said it really helped. It helped us also psychosocially. And we could talk in the evening about agriculture, about growing vegetables. And we started remi remembering our farms, the orchard farms. So this really helps. Syria, I mean, if you, I mean, this is the latest crisis that everybody's aware of. Last six months, I have been supporting the Syrian refugees in southern, southeastern Turkey. Uh, Turkey is hosting 3.5 million Syrian refugees. But at the same time, Turkey also has about 10% of the youth unemployed, and they also have a lot of seasonal agriculture workers. So FAO and UNHCR, we started a project together at a lower scale, started supporting the Syrian refugees, building their skills, vocational skills, training, and facilitating the job in the local market. And last month, I was in Gaziantep. I had a meeting with some Syrian refugees, including agro-engineers and agronomists. And they said, only in Gaziantep, we had 300 educated agriculturists. And we are doing nothing. That's, that's probably a nonlinear approach. We have to think, how can we engage these people? At the same time, we are using the private sectors to train these people on the job. So this is an opportunity that they are interacting with the Turkish interpreters, learning the language, and enhancing this sort of like a social cohesion. You may recall the report from International Crisis Group that came out in February this year that said the situation in some of the provinces in Southeast Turkey is alarming. Some of the provinces like Kilis or Sanli Urfa, the population is half-half almost. So unless, you know, we, as, as, as I, I really liked what you said, Bernard, we really need to think so a nonlinear approach and start thinking, how can we engage these people? Humanitarian assistance is critical, definitely. As we manage, thanks to all of you, the famine last year was averted in these four countries, but the situation is not yet over. South Sudan is still suffering. Yemen is still suffering. Humanitarian action is needed, but Development and peace building interventions need to start, and we have to work together. And again, I come back to Bernard saying we have to work together. Yes, global food security, this, uh, uh, the report we mentioned. And also thanks to Netherlands, I believe there is a representative from the Netherlands here. This, uh, your effort made it possible to have this UN Security Council Resolution 2047-2018 that recognized food security could be drivers of forced displacement, and conversely, forced displacement also have devastating impact on agricultural production and livelihood. So we have come to this stage. I think we are already out of the box. Now we need to move forward. Working together, this global report on food crisis was first step. Again, it started with EU, FAO, and WP. We were three agencies, and now we are 12 at global level. And it is picking up the momentum. And it's just like, it's a, it's, it's, it looks like a report, but it's a real consensus building exercise that we have agreed to work together, share the information together, plan the things together, inform each other on programming, and develop this network, this food security information network. We are all part of the World Humanitarian Summit. I think we have all signed different commitments. As FAO, as I represent FAO, we have a colleague from WFP. At the highest level, our director general and WFP executive director, they are traveling together to different countries, giving a very joint message saying, we are here together and we want to work together. And it's a time to develop the synergies, getting out of the box, coming to the nonlinear approach, and address the food security uh, on, on this humanitarian development peace nexus, promote joint programming, 
partnership, advocacy. I was working for the Global Food Security Cluster, actually sitting in WFP for the last two and a half years. And we have been, I was very closely working with different NGO partners. We really need to work together and enhance this advocacy and partnership. First achievement was definitely this report, but we have a way forward. Some of the examples I would like to bring here from the field on this humanitarian development programming. At Rome level, we started this Rome-based agencies initiatives on resilience building. It is FAO, WFP, and IFAD. Uh, we have a framework, and it's a sort of a global program. And with multifunding, it has made us possible to come up with different frameworks and different approaches, some papers. At the field level, one good example is Niger, where WFP provided support on food for assets, restoring pasture land and water infrastructure. FAO, we provided technical support on food diversification, farmer field schools, agricultural practices, good nutrition practices, and IFAT provided fund to invest in rural infrastructure. And this project also targeted rural youth, and that helped create jobs, and that also helped minimize out-migration. So if we work together, there are possibilities. There are different platforms. There are avenues. Somalia is another example where FAO, uh, WFP, and UNICEF work together. WFP provided safety nets. We focused on production, and UNICEF provided access to basic services and protection. Unfortunately, because of the drought, because of the climate change, the last year, I mean, you know, the result of this project was pretty good, actually. Uh, when we responded, uh, when we, uh, thank you, sir, <laughs> I'm finishing. Uh, when we talked to the beneficiaries, they said, the level of confidence has really built up, and they have been able to cope with the situation, and they have enhanced their resilience. 38% of the people responded. And the, these beneficiaries also reported increase in income of 118%. Unfortunately, because of the drought and climate change, this has spiraled back. The momentum was gained. The process is started. process is initiated. I think we have come to a point, and this can be processed further. This can go further. With this, I would like to stop here. I think I maintain the time, two minutes, uh, 10 minutes. So agriculture as a means. And I want to cite one another example. Uh, I was in Peshawar in 2012. I went to see the director of uh, FATA Development Management, uh, Disaster Management Authority. After a meeting, he told me, can we talk in private? So he asked everybody to go out, and two of us, we talked. And he said, listen, I have a guy and I need a job for him. He's, he's from a farming family. He's a farmer, but he studied IT. And the guy was very bright on information technology. He came out of Peshawar University, and he was hijacked by Taliban. And he was asked to develop GIS maps of different cities in Afghanistan. And the guy escaped from that captivity. And he was looking for a job. And the job he was looking for was in agriculture. So that means in also in order to avoid this type of qualified youths, I think agriculture is a very good entry point. I stop here. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Rajendra, pour nous avoir uh, présenté uh, une, une, une série d'exemples très illustratifs de de ce qui peut être fait et de comment tout cela s'articule dans une vision non linéaire, comme je le disais au début. Merci beaucoup. Je vais donner la parole à, au troisième intervenant avant que nous ayons des questions-réponses. Je fais attention à ce qu'il y ait du temps quand même d'échange à la fin de ces trois présentations. Alexandros Ragoussis, qui est de l'IFC dans le, dans le groupe de la Banque mondiale, euh, va nous éclairer, je pense, sur les questions de l'investissement dans ce, dans ce contexte et, et comment on peut penser l'investissement dans les situations de fragilité. Vous avez la parole. Merci. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, I don't, I haven't prepared a, a PowerPoint for this. Uh, I think there is an, an inflation of PowerPoints in these uh, uh, meetings, so I'll, I'll just uh, keep my intervention short with a few talking points. But I'll start by picking up on what the other uh, speakers have uh, have talked about. So, there are, I mean, as, as you all understand, there are two ways of thinking about. Um, uh, agriculture and economic activity, uh, sorry, agriculture and fragility, which is a, a broader way of thinking about economic activity, development, and conflict. Right. So you can think you can think about it in in a way of uh, how conflict affects economic activity, 
right? And so it's very difficult to grow businesses, to grow in agriculture when you, uh, when you have situations of risk, or situations of displacement. Um, and you can think, a bit, think of it about it in the reverse way, right? Which is um, economic activity as a solution to conflict. Thinking about how agriculture, for example, can change conflict dynamics. How can it create resilience? How can it be part of the, part of the solution? Um, and this is a, a more general thinking about uh, the relationship of development and conflict, right? And, 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 and that's where I think our institutions um, diverge from um, the very valid views that, that James has expressed. So we think that the two cannot be separated. The two approaches, you can't have the two approaches discussed in separate rooms. So poverty and economic exclusion triggers conflict, and conflict creates poverty, right? Uh, and then the fact that conflict is not um, driven only by poverty, and it's not driven only by economic exclusion, does not invalidate the strong relationship that you have between the two. So um, this is the main reason why uh, you see increasingly development partners engaging in this process. And um, I'll, give you so, I'll give you some pieces of data that are specifically for, for, for um, uh, relevant to agriculture. So there is, at the World Bank, we have, like, a, a, like James said, we have a list of fragile and conflict-affected um, countries. These are about 40 countries. There are, most of them are low income. Not all of them are low income. There are specific criteria that we use to, to classify them. Um, and then if you look at the top sector in national value added in these countries, as opposed to any other low income country that you have in the world, then you have twice, two times a greater chance of having agriculture um, uh, topping any other sector. Are you surprised? No. This is a combination of underdevelopment and risk that keeps these countries one step behind in terms of industrialization. Now, less economic exclusion means a more stable future for them. Okay? And we know that agriculture is part of breaking this cycle, breaking the cycle from economic exclusion and poverty to conflict. And in fact, we know, we, we have shown and we have uh, data to show that um, agriculture is two to four times more effective um, in lifting people out of extreme poverty, which is the me a, a strong measure of economic exclusion, than uh, investment in any other sector of, uh, of economic activity. And what is very interesting is what, is what I s said earlier, that we didn't used to engage in these conversations as, as World Bank. 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have, when you would talk about uh, economic activity and conflict, when you would talk about conflict in general, you wouldn't have the World Bank in the room. Um, right? Because these situations, these countries were considered too messy, too risky for us to engage. We wouldn't work there. We would wait for um, the situations to stabilize and then we would go in. Uh, that has changed, and if there is one point that I would like you to retain from, from my intervention is that that has changed. Uh, we are asked to do more and we do more um, in these countries. And part, part, you know, a great part of this effort is on agriculture. We invest in agricultural projects, we reassure other investors, we mobilize resources for agriculture, and we work on all sorts of enabling conditions for uh, agriculture to grow so that we can foster basically its potential on um, addressing economic exclusion and peace. And we have results to show, right? So specifically, um, for fragile and conflict states, the, the, the IFC, which is the private sector um, uh, arm of the World Bank, has doubled its investment commitments in agriculture only over the, over the course of the past five years. And we have also increased five times our investment in power and in infrastructure, specifically in fragile and conflict states, which, is, which allows basically to take uh, agriculture a step up from where we are at the moment. Has it, has it been easy? No, it hasn't been easy. Why? There are no entry points, right? So agriculture in fragile and conflict states is, is, is again a step back from um, the rest of the world. It's in, a lot of it is informal, it's not organized, it's not mechanized, it's, um, 
it's targeting resilience rather than growth, right? And uh, I mean, there's there's plenty of data to 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 to, to support this. I mean, 16% of farmers only have wage jobs um, in fragile and conflict states in agriculture. Uh, and, and, and there are projections that this will reach something like 25% into to 2030, but this is again one out of four. Three out of four people that work in agriculture are not working in an organized manner. So there are no entry points for a development institution to go in and invest and put, put money in, uh, in growing the sector. This is also the reason why uh, a, a lot of these, um, in a lot of these countries, the fragile and conflict affected countries, you don't see a lot of foreign investment coming in, right? So, again, I'll give you a piece of a piece of uh, uh, our, our own uh, our own analysis. Only one percent of global FDI goes to the 40 countries that I talked to you about. That's five times less per capita than. Uh, than anywhere else in the in in the world, okay, and uh, most of this pie, the the foreign investment pie, goes to extractives, telecoms, construction. It doesn't go to agriculture. Why? Because there are no entry points. Because the same problems that we face basically when we try to grow to grow this sector. Um, so how do we do it? So how do we do it? How do we how do we grow our investments? We create the entry points ourselves. We place investment offices on the ground. We bring in strong partners. We bring in lead international firms that we reassure, and we connect them with domestic, uh, with domestic small small producers. That would be the case of Cargill, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire. That would be the case of of, uh, of Bayer, also in the, in the Ukraine, which is not in the list of fragile states because of all the problems of the list of fragile states that we have. Um, so. Um, what do they do? They train cooperative managers. They uh, make sure the supply links are in place. They empower new players outside the, the conflict ecosystem in order to make agriculture investable. This is, the, this, is the, this is the goal. Create these entry points. And then we put resources for investment ourselves. So a big innovation you know, that, 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 that happened last year in the last replenishment of, the, of IDA was what, we, what is called the private sector window. So uh, this is a, a, a resources, 2.5 billion in, in particular, uh, earmarked for investment specifically in fragile and conflict states and specifically for, for the private sector where there is no other commercial solution. A large chunk of this money is going to go to agriculture. Um, this is something that we do. I, along with our resources, we mobilize also resources from, from donors. And this is a, these, are, these are all blended finance uh, uh, initiatives. A uh, good example specifically for that is the, 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 the GAF-SP, so the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program. Uh, that is hosted by the World Bank, and it's, it basically mixes concessional finance with commercial finance. Um, uh, to address the credit constraints for farmers. And here we're talking about $1.35 uh, billion uh, committed, specifically for agriculture. Uh, and you know, money is important, but we know that money, money is not alone going to drive change. So what we, we also do is we, we make sure that we provide also other things, like advisory services, for example. We make sure that both the governments and the cooperatives and the, the, the farmers, they have the, the know-how to, to grow their businesses. And I'll give you, uh, uh, you know, another piece of data that, is, that, is, that, is, um, that highlights this effort. For every dollar we commit in, 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 in fragile and conflict states, IFC spends two times more in advisory services than in any other low-income country, specifically to address these needs. Um, and we also try to make sure, in addition, that, that, that these farmers and these producers, they have access to international markets. Why? Because the domestic markets and domestic income is not enough in fragile and conflict states to um, uh, grow, to support growth in um, uh, in agriculture. And again, uh, I'll give you another piece of data. IFC guarantees three times greater shares of cross-border trade um, in fragile and conflict states than in any other low-income low income, uh, context. So, what, so how do we do it? We place people on the ground, just to summarize. We rely on strong partners. We earmark more resources for investment. 
we mobilize investment from other sources, from donors, and uh, we provide advisory services and we make sure that markets are open to international trade. Now, the World Bank Group in general and the IFC in particular is the largest multilateral investor in fragile and conflict states by any statistic. So we can pat ourselves on the back and say, well done. Well, we don't do that. <laughs> right, so, <laughs> so a lot of our work is also about improving our own processes, our own standards, our own processes and, and, and measures of success. We realize that we're far from um, addressing all the needs. And we, we realize also that we are far from seeing a tangible change at the macro level. We know that we create stability in, in local communities. We see that, we hear that, same as the FAO. Uh, but in terms of bringing peace at the macro level, we know that we're still far from that, right? So there is a long way to go, and there is a, a, a lot of thinking that needs to be done to take us there. So this is why we're also here to discuss. Thank you. Merci, Alexandros. Un message très clair, hein? et, et finalement, vous me faites plaisir comme président de cette séance d'avoir deux deux intervenants qui disent qu'ils ne sont pas tout à fait d'accord. Ça va rendre le débat riche. Euh, je vais ouvrir le, aux questions-réponses. Euh, Madame, si vous voulez bien vous présenter et poser votre question, s'il vous plaît. Je ne suis pas très bonne dans la technologie. Euh, je suis Nadine Dominicus, écrivain belge et membre d'une ONG depuis dix ans en Guinée-Bissau. Euh, Il était temps, franchement, ça fait plus de dix ans qu'on attend des positions comme ces trois interlocuteurs. Hein Bravo pour vous. Je n'ai pas traduit moi ça en anglais. Je... D'accord. Alors, euh, je veux vous citer des exemples. C'est vrai que l'agriculture est un facteur de gouvernance locale. Elle produit une gouvernance locale à travers le système communautaire en Afrique. Je ne dis pas qu'il n'y a pas de conflit, mais elle produit une gouvernance locale qui permet de refuser les conflits. Et je vous cite, en Guinée-Bissau, il y a une guerre civile qui a fait un tapage international, mais en fait, elle s'est limitée à la capitale de Bissau et 30 km autour. Et les populations ont tourné le dos, n'ont pas voulu entrer dans les débats. Alors, la croissance dans l'endroit éloigné où je suis, elle est la plus forte de tout le pays, avec de l'informel ou du formel. Et la Guinée-Bissau a réussi à maintenir un taux de pauvreté bien inférieur à celui de l'Angola, qui était un pouvoir fort avec de l'argent, grâce à tous ces systèmes communautaires. Donc, euh, à peu près euh, 60% contre 78 ou quelque chose comme ça. Donc, vous voulez identifier les, les causes de fragilité, c'est très bien, mais il faut d'abord essayer de voir quelles sont partout toutes les réponses que les gens ont trouvées pour éviter justement, pour combattre la fragilité. Et à partir de là, du bas vers le haut, vous aurez plus que de partir du haut de l'État vers le bas. Excusez-moi. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor Linson from the MNRC. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist, very much interested in the education of tomorrow and the governance of tomorrow. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what's going to be the concrete impact of these discussions beyond um, intellectual entertainment. Uh, we are speaking of fragile states. Um, well, EU is also very fragile. And uh, I don't think that Africa, that is still plundered in the name of democracy, uh, should keep on relying on the EU that uh, is steadily um, losing the, uh, credibility. I'm sorry. In 2008, uh, the EU was becoming trapped in a circle of not being trusted and therefore unable to make its case. In 2018, the EU is trapped in a circle of not being trusted and therefore unable to make its case. So to my mind, I think the time is ripe 
to prepare the mindsets of citizens worldwide for a transition to new global governance, inviting coordinated collective citizen institution collaboration on an equal footing with equal opportunities. We are faced with a global network of interconnected global challenges that can only be appropriately managed by first setting up a new global governance infrastructure, integrating all the bureaucratic monsters, uh, United Nations, OECD, EU, etc. Thank you. Perhaps there, we shall see perhaps a bit more um, efficiency and impact on the citizens' well-being, quality of life. Thank you. Merci. Madame Dhoni. Hi. Um, if, you mind, if you mind introducing yourself I will. before yes. taking the yes. floor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Catherine Downey, and I'm the head of quality assurance, m and &E knowledge and innovation for the Somalia Resilience Program, which is a seven NGO consortium, which looks at um, livelihood building and resilience projects uh, in Somalia. Um, I wanted to speak to the point that Alexandros made about entry points for agriculture. One of the greatest difficulties we have is in trying to go beyond smallholder subsistence to adoption and uptake of technologies, for example, for impact through scale. And what I mean by that is I'll give you an example, and this is in no way a criticism, but for example, if we speak to the World Bank about trying to form cooperatives, trying to, for example, trial drought-tolerant technologies like le legumes and seeds, for example, we are usually told, oh, well, our agricultural inputs go to FAO. That's where we put our money. That's where what we call the agricultural seeds and tools kits go and they fund and they are given to smallholder subsistence farmers. Now, we are trying to look at agriculture as economic an economic growth strategy eventually. I mean, we realize that the entry points are very difficult. When you've got a population that has not largely gone beyond subsistence, it is difficult to start talking about the formation of cooperatives, etc. But we at at the very least want to start looking at funding demonstration plots and trying to actually, what I would call, bridge the gap between the smallholder farmer and, say, the research and latest agricultural technologies, which could have a profound impact on scale. So what we find is, and, and on the other side, I also want to say that even DEVCO doesn't work in Somalia right now. ECHO does, but in terms of being seen as a long-term um, arena for economic growth, it is very difficult to convince donors, almost all of them, that this is going to be a playing field in which we can start thinking about economic growth strategies. So what I wondered is, you know, perhaps in this room we could start a conversation about state fragility and economic growth strategies, and how do we go about actually convincing people that there are entry points for this? Thank you very much. I'll take this, Mr. at the end. Bonjour, Jean-Jacques Grodan de l'ONG SOS Fin. J'ai beaucoup aimé l'intervention de M. Putzel avec euh, son bilan de plus d'une vingtaine d'années d'examen et d'analyse des, des situations de conflit et des, des modalités d'en sortir. Et euh, suite à l'intervention de M. Ray, effectivement, j'ai pointé au moins deux points de divergence avec euh, l'approche de la Banque mondiale. Le premier, c'est effectivement... Euh, la nécessité de passer par les structures étatiques pour euh, introduire euh, et soutenir une agriculture, d'un côté, et d'autre part, c'est de privilégier une agriculture qui soit tournée vers le marché local, vers le marché domestique, et qui renforce en fait les structures de marché domestique. Et je suis interpellé parce qu'effectivement, la Banque mondiale, et je le reconnais très franchement, a beaucoup réinvesti dans l'agriculture, mais quand on examine effectivement les différents programmes qui sont mis les uns derrière les autres en matière d'agriculture dans des situations de pays fragiles ou euh, en, en situation de conflit, le bilan, je trouve, est, est extrêmement mitigé. Et je prendrai un exemple, le pays comme la RDC. Je connais assez bien le, le, le problème de l'investissement dans ce pays 
concernant les parcs agro-industriels. Ça génère des dizaines, voire des centaines de millions de dollars d'investissement en laissant de côté complètement la petite agriculture qui est tout à fait marginalisée dans ce contexte et les succès rencontrés par ces parcs agro-industriels posent évidemment de grandes questions dans la mesure où, quand il y a d'une production, elle est effectivement fortement orientée vers un marché international et pas le marché local. Et je trouvais que le, 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 le point de conflit ou dans tous les cas d'interpellation que vous que vous signaliez, était extrêmement pertinent pour la journée d'aujourd'hui. Merci. Je vous en prie. Oui, merci. Marek Poznanski du collectif Stratégie Alimentaire. C'est une ONG liée au syndicat agricole belge et à l'intérieur d'un réseau qui s'appelle Agricorte. En fait, c'est pour continuer, disons, les, les remarques qui viennent d'être faites, notamment sur cette différence d'approche de la Banque mondiale, et pour rajouter une petite chose à ce qui a été, été déjà dit, sur la question des points d'entrée. Alors peut-être que je n'ai pas compris, mais un des points d'entrée qui a été donné par le représentant de la Banque mondiale, c'était de dire, au fond, c'est les, les agriculteurs qui sont salariés. Enfin, c'est les, les, on va dire les ouvriers agricoles. Ça, c'est une manière, disons, euh, d'avoir un point d'entrée par leur entreprise. Alors je crois que c'est faire l'impasse sur ce qui a été le développement, en tout cas en Europe, mais aussi aux états unis et ailleurs, l'agriculture familiale, qui n'a pas toujours été, euh, disons, des, des grands agriculteurs. Si on regarde une ou deux générations avant, les agriculteurs chez nous, c'était des petits agriculteurs, qui petit à petit, il y a eu des programmes. Et donc, le point d'entrée, évidemment, ce n'est pas l'agriculteur individuel, parce qu'il y en a des millions et c'est très difficile, et peut-être dans certains états fragiles, ils ne sont pas regroupés, mais quand même, lorsqu'on regarde une série de pays qui sont considérés comme fragiles, et on aura cet après-midi l'exemple avec le Burundi, il y a énormément de coopératives. Et l'importance des coopératives, par exemple en Europe, euh, je, je rappelle que plus de 40% des produits commercialisés et transformés en Europe le sont par les coopératives et dans certains secteurs c'est 70%. C'était justement dû, l'essor de ces coopératives a été justement dû par ce que d'autres secteurs n'étaient pas forts à ce moment-là. Et ce que je crains aujourd'hui, euh, c'est que bon, effectivement il y a une redécouverte de l'importance du secteur agricole, mais comme il y a pas mal d'années on avait, on avait erré, on s'était sans doute trompé dans des interventions humanitaires où par les interventions humanitaires on avait souvent découragé la production locale et par exemple le p 4 p est justement une réponse par rapport à l'aide alimentaire. Je crains qu'aujourd'hui avec le secteur privé on, on fasse un peu tout et n'importe quoi aussi. Donc en ayant une idéologie très forte et peut-être justement en investissant euh, d'une certaine manière, eh bien en fait on crée de la fragilité parce qu'on crée euh, des déséquilibres territoriaux, on renforce euh, euh, parfois euh, des, des injustices lo locales. Euh, donc il y, y a plein de, de raisons, et surtout dans des états fragiles, parce que je veux seulement reprendre un, un exemple historique qui un jour m'avait fortement marqué, c'est lorsque l'Irlande euh, a eu sa grande famine euh, eh bien elle a continué à largement exporter ses céréales vers l'Angleterre donc on peut très très bien se retrouver dans des pays où on a des forts problèmes d'insécurité mais le choix stratégique et des gouvernements et peut-être parfois des, des investisseurs va aller dans une autre direction donc je pense qu'il faut vraiment par penser la question des investissements par rapport notamment aux coopératives agricoles existantes donc je suis d'accord que ce n'est pas forcément possible à faire partout, même si c'est une stratégie à long terme, et en tout cas, euh, ne pas uniquement, justement, comme ça a été dit, se aller vers les solutions qui ont, qui ont l'air d'être efficientes immédiatement, mais qui, euh, à long terme, euh, risquent de ne pas changer le, le pouvoir de marché. Alors, juste encore peut-être un tout petit élément, parce que c'est quelque chose qui se passe aussi au niveau du programme alimentaire mondial, il y a le programme P4P, mais il, donc, qui essaye de, de s'appuyer sur les coopératifs, mais maintenant ils sont en train d'aller aussi vers des systèmes qui peut-être financeraient Cargill, par exemple, pour aller auprès des petits producteurs. Mais, mais la situation est tout à fait différente. Peut-être que dans l'immédiat ça va fonctionner, mais ça ne va jamais changer les, 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 les relations en termes de pouvoir de marché. Donc voilà, c'était juste pour souligner que je crois que M. James Putzel a, a réellement bien expliqué ce, cela. Et que voilà, merci. 
Merci. Je, il y aura une présentation sur, dans la deuxième séance sur euh, P4P, donc je suggère qu'on qu qu laisse ce sujet de pour l'instant. Isolina, vous vouliez dire quelque oui, chose Oui, merci beaucoup. J'ai une question pour James. J'ai une question question basée sur votre extensive expérience sur l'agriculture et la fragilité. Quels seraient les cas que vous would rate comme succès qui out of a very very highly fragile context to a more development ou at least uh, improvements For Rajendra, I have a quick question. <coughs> I was interested in the last part of practical cases in the field uh, with the collaboration of some of the UN uh, and international organizations that we welcome indeed. But who are you uh, implementers or partners in the ground? This wasn't uh, clearly appearing. And uh, for Alexandros, I have also a question on the investment which has really increased, you know, on agriculture. On the fragile countries, would you uh, have just one or two examples of, you know, uh, the investment on the on the top fragile ones? Thank you very much. Alors, euh, les deux dernières questions, euh, je prendrai d'abord au fond et ensuite de ce côté. Euh, merci beaucoup. Je m'appelle Cherlo du Sénégal. Je travaille à l'ambassade du Sénégal. Euh, C'est vrai que je ne suis pas un expert dans ce domaine, mais peut-être une petite interrogation euh, après avoir entendu les, les intervenants. Moi, je pense que ce que je retiens premièrement, c'est que la fragilité n'est pas une fatalité. Je crois que ce pas une fatalité à l'entendre tous les intervenants. Et je partage même le point de vue de, du premier intervenant, notamment sur la définition, en fait, qui est très compliquée de la fragilité. Et je pense fondamentalement qu'on ne peut avoir une définition universelle de la fragilité. Peut-être qu'il y a une fragilité en fonction des pays. Parce que si on prend l'exemple de la nouvelle définition de l'OCDE, avec ses dimensions économiques, environnementales et tout, je pense que euh, pratiquement tous les pays du monde, peut-être, ont une certaine fragilité. Donc, je pense que pour nous, les pays ACP, pour nous, les pays africains, peut-être, il y a des degrés variables de fragilité, peut-être qu'il faut prendre en considération et ne plus prendre en considération une définition plus ou moins universelle qui serait plus ou moins appliquée à tous les pays ACP ou bien à tous les pays pauvres. Je pense que les chercheurs en ont besoin, peut-être, pour avoir certains indicateurs pour mieux faire des recherches sur le terrain. Mais fondamentalement, je pense qu'il est très difficile quand même d'avoir une définition universelle applicable en tout temps et en tout lieu, en tout cas à, à tous les pays du monde. Et l'autre point de vue que je voudrais partager un peu, c'est quelle agriculture, en tout cas pour limiter la fragilité. Je pense que la fragilité a un impact sur le secteur agricole, mais inversement également, il y a certains politiques agricoles qui peuvent avoir aussi un impact, en tout cas pour accentuer la fragilité. Et je pense à ce niveau-là, après, il faut aussi mener la réflexion. Merci. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Michel Lavollet, Public-Private Partnerships Europe. I, I'd like to throw in uh, two things. One is picking up on the FAO presentation on the situation in Africa and on nutrition. Uh, I would refer you to the more recent report from the OECD Club du Sahel that actually picks up on, your da on the data on the deterioration of the situation, but also identifies as a major gap the lack of access to data. The second point I want to make is because I, I work as a partnership broker, I work with private companies, uh, public institutions, NGOs, so I have a long experience of these partnerships. I think that uh, there is clearly a space for building strategic partnerships with the private sector around the common goal, which is an answer to these questions that you have about privatization and, you know, what is the motivation of this one or that one. And we do have a lot of experience with WFP, with FAO, with uh, World Vision. We know that partnerships work. Here, in answering to the questions that you raise on structural choices for Africa, on resilience, and what uh, Viwanu mentioned about index insurance and things like that. There are partners out there that have very efficient solutions that have been tested throughout Africa using cell phones. Uh, ICT technologies, connection with satellite, the insurance sector, uh, the big value chain people, even the WEF Africa people, agriculture, are now interesting, 
in these strategic solutions. So I would suggest that there would be a tremendous benefit spending a bit more time on those partnership mechanisms that will actually support proper scale-up and enough pilot projects across Africa. We know what works. Merci. Je vais donner la parole aux, aux trois intervenants euh, successivement sur, pour réagir en, en cinq minutes à peu près. De, de, il y a eu quelques questions spécifiques, mais je pense que globalement, c'était des questions, des réactions générales. Et peut-être que, James, les, votre réaction à, 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 ce, à ces réactions du, de, des participants. OK, thank you very much. I thought all those interventions were interesting and thought provoking. I mean, in response to my colleague from the bank, I think it's excellent that the World Bank is now working around conflict places, places more troubled, not just the best performers. That's huge progress. And it's great to see the IFC also going out of its comfort zone. So I, I really do think that's a big advance. But there is a problem with the enthusiasm we now have in the international community that private sector is going to be able to be mobilized to solve and address these issues. The whole entire SDGs are kind of fairy tale without massive private sector involvement. And it's just not the nature of private capital to go into really highly risky places. So of course they have a role to play. And the more that it can be mobilized, the better. Uh, there is a lot of allusion to, I think, around public-private partnerships. You know, I, I became scandalized when I saw that DFID was now promoting a kind of advice to developing countries around PPPs more generally, because the PPPs in the UK have been uniformly disastrous. And why? Because it has to do with how one organizes and, and, and assigns risk. Okay. So in many of the PPP actual empirical experiences, private sector can walk away and the public is left holding the bag. In this case, it's often the, don the donor country public left holding the bag. But, so I think it's obviously we want to see the promotion of private sector actors in all situations in the developing world. That's one of the things about underdevelopment is that there's not capital accumulation and there's not investment expansion of production. However, I think that this has only been historically accomplished in our states with state involvement and encouragement, setting incentives and regulating. And in these places, it's really essential. And I'm sorry, but if you look at the most conflict-affected places, the private sector is not going to be playing the major role. So it's good to keep an eye on it. But the, the other thing I want to say, in Guinea-Bissau, uh, it was quite striking, um, the, the, the situation, because um, we saw um, the pressures to, earlier on to get a balanced budget that came from the International Monetary Fund led to budget reductions which stopped police payments and therefore were a driver of conflict in the place, right? So I think we, the specificity, it's not that we don't want to talk about development and conflict together. Of course they should be. But we do need to look at the drivers. And one of the big problems is that a lot of donor assistance, agricultural programs and others are being put into places without any understanding of the sinews of power in a place. Which elites are included, which are excluded? Because how does an IFC program or a big investment in an agricultural uh, commercial farm affect local power structures? That can be much more important in relationship to prolonged conflict, displacing people and the kind of kickback against that. So in terms of your specific question, I, I have comments to say about a lot of the other things that people intervened on, but it goes beyond my five minutes. Um, what's a positive example? I think we probably find a lot, and a lot of you spoke to very positive micro level interventions that are going on that, that make agricultural 
people who are among the poorest and therefore also very vulnerable to being mobilized for violence, there's a lot of successes in FA FAO interventions in other places. If you try to look at national movement with agriculture, I think there is a huge amount to be learned from Rwanda. And Rwanda, compared to Burundi, we have a colleague from Burundi who's going to be speaking uh, about things, it, it's quite a striking comparison. Using cooperatives and private sector, but one of the first things that the government of the RPF did was they rounded up all the NGOs and threw them out of the country. And they said, come back when you design programs that are conducive to the national development vision that we have, which they did. And so we see that there has been an important creation of state capacity where it was lacking to be able to rely a lot on private sector actors, actually, foreign and, and, and domestic, uh, mostly domestic, uh, but with, with a state regulatory framework. And, so, and to build up those capacities, be able to manage the budget, to know about agriculture. In other words, have people in the Ministry of Agriculture in Rwanda now who, who really know what are the agricultural possibilities, what are the potential market possibilities, be able to coordinate certain incentive structures so that Rwandan coffee could massively restore its productivity and then even gain foothold in UK supermarkets and whatnot as a, um, you know, as a, as a niche pro product. Um, so I think there, there's a lot to learn from how they did agriculture along with other things. But of course, it's very controversial. It's controversial politically. This is not a place of great political freedom, but it's a place of quite considerable safety, security, and now incremental growth from a very poor starting point. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, starting from Isolina, uh, regarding the implementing partners, normally we work with a network of local NGOs, international NGOs, wherever possible, also with the local governments. If you are interested, I can get the details. Uh, <coughs> uh, the example from Guinea-Bissau, I, mean, I actually I was also remembering another example from, from Kenya and Uganda uh, because of the drought last year. The pastoralists from Kenya, in order to escape the drought, they were taking their livestock <coughs> to Uganda and the conflict started. And IGAD played a very vital role. And <clears throat> somehow IGAD managed to facilitate and, and come to a consensus. And now I understand that, and, and they develop a sort of like a framework. And I understand now that South Sudan and Ethiopia, they're also going to follow the same. So the bottom line, I mean, there are solutions also. I think there are certain solutions available locally, rather than looking at the things more from policy level or macro level. You know? But for that, we need to invest a lot of energy, time, and, and negotiation and dialogue. Private sector is the same, actually. I, I, mean, I myself, I try to bring Chamber of Commerce and Industry in few countries. And, and we realized from the first meeting that we speak different language, especially in this humanitarian development nexus. We have to really find a sort of like a common language that we understand each other. It's not only profit making or doing business. It's also uh, probably, you know, so I think for that also we need to invest time. We really need to understand. And thanks for raising this and, and being a representative from the private sector. Uh, I was ref referring to the example from Turkey. We managed to bring the Turkish Chamber of Agriculture Commerce uh, for creation of job because they, they, they are a sort of like an umbrella organization with different members. And we actually facilitated the on-the-job training for Turkish refugees in their uh, entrepreneurship, like say a livestock farm or, or pistachio farm or, or you know apple apple orchards. So there there is opportunity. Um, uh, I don't want to talk more about development because that's really not my area <coughs> of expertise. But uh, I think um, we need to somehow you know engage ourselves more and more into this. Uh, uh, this example from Somalia, uh, World Vision, I am really not aware of uh, this, so maybe we can talk uh, bilaterally later. Personally, I was very closely working with World Vision at different forums, especially on coordination issues. Uh, so maybe uh, we can uh, we can talk um, later. Uh, thank you very much for this OECD report. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, consider this as well, and I'll talk to my colleagues. And uh, last point, World Bank, I, we have uh, started an initiative, a uh, collaboration in Yemen. 
Uh, I think it's going pretty well. But uh, this is also since you have been asked to work more and more in fragile countries, I think you also need to uh, ease some of your procedures, you know, because uh, the train doesn't wait for us. It's, it's really critical and we cannot spend like six months on negotiation and contracting and also I think it's interest of everybody. So, well, I mean, the, the, the ball is rolling definitely, but uh, we need to find uh, better procedures, facilitate quicker, and let the get, get the benefits out to the people as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandros. Yeah, so thank you. All very, very, very stimulating uh, comments and questions. <laughs> I'm very, very happy uh, about this. Uh, well, there are, there are uh, a lot of comments that I, that, I w that I can obviously talk about bilaterally afterwards uh, about specific objections, about the, the measures that I, that I mentioned. But I would like to focus on, on, um, on the comment about the differences in the approach, and, and that, was a very, that was very spot on. The, the differences in the approach, uh, in our approach with respect to uh, um, other institutions, I guess, lie in, in, in two things, the state versus non-state actors, who do we work with, and international versus domestic solutions, right? So this, is, this, was, this was very spot on. And I would say that there, there are reasons for this. So, so first of all, on the state and non-state actors, um, uh, we don't exclude any. So we know that the, 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 the long-term solutions rely with the state, but the state structures in fragile and conflict states, they are actually very fluid themselves, right? And also often governments are part of the problem. So you don't really solve a problem by working only with the government. Um, so this is, um, this, is a, this is a very important thing to keep in mind, right? Uh, th there is a principle that, that we um, work on that says basically that we do not just work on the long-term solutions or just on the short-term solutions. We need to do both at the same time. And that means working with the government, but also to get short-term solutions, to get jobs, to get economic activity going, you need to also go outside the formal route, especially if that formal route is part of the problem, right? So this is this, this is important to keep in mind. On international and domestic solutions, um, there are three main reasons actually why uh, why why you would also look internationally. First of all, um, you want to in a fragile situation, a complex situation, you want to break some of the toxic political economy dynamics that fuel the conflict, right? So by going, by going outside and seeking, bringing in other players, bringing in uh, basically someone external to the system, then uh, you move away from everything that, that creates also um, uh, the conflict. Of course, you, you need to be conflict, you know, what we call conflict sensitive in how you do that, because you may actually aggravate situations later. And, and that is a dilemma that, that, that you, you, there is no easy solution to. You know, the solutions that we have found is to actually go in thoroughly and examine and take months and months and months to approve, a, uh, uh, a, you know, any investment that we do with, with international or, or, or national investors. But that basically uh, moves us away from having solutions now, now when they're needed, you know. Um, and we face, again, criticism for, for not being efficient enough. Um, but... Uh, in general, as a principle, working with international partners makes sense. It makes sense to break the political economy dynamics. It makes sense to bring some stability of incomes because basically the economic activity is very volatile in, in, in many of these situations because of the conflict, because of fragility. So you want a stable stream of income that comes from abroad. And it, it also makes sense in, in terms of standards, in terms of know-how, in terms of scaling up basically later on. Um, and then uh, and then I would agree with with with, uh, with with James that it's not it's not really an obvious uh, no, an obvious thing to do because the, the private sector is not driven uh, to risky situations, so that's where we can actually make most of a difference by signalling what is possible by by ma using our leverage to bring in some. Um, uh, some players that can uh, that can that can that can make a difference. Um, in terms of uh, examples on uh, on uh, examples of investments that, that that have been most successful, I would say there are many, but they're mostly concentrated in countries that are slightly away from full-blown conflict. 
right, in terms of time or in terms of space. So we're talking about uh, projects in Cote d'Ivoire, we're talking about projects in Lebanon, we're talking about projects in, in Nepal. Uh, there is a learning process, like I said, for us too. Right? So getting out of our comfort zone and getting into situations that are more risky is also a learning process for us in order to move further on into situations like Syria or Yemen or the impossible ones, making the, possible, you know, the impossible possible. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for all the participants for a, a very lively debate. We are going to have a second session after the coffee break where there will be examples uh, presented and I suppose that will uh, revive the debate on specific cases. Uh, I wish you a good day and it was a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. So please, can we restart? You will have still the lunch after, when we finish to, um, um, to network a bit. So we have very interesting uh, presentations now, if everybody can sit. And my director, Michael Ailu, will uh, uh, moderate the second panel. Thank you very much. OK, welcome back to the next uh, panel, where we'll be looking at uh, specific examples from fragile states, uh, successes and uh, uh, experiences you know, that uh, uh, the, the speakers will share with us. So we have four speakers at the next panel, so it's a fairly uh, tight uh, agenda that we have. So without any further ado, I will uh, invite our first speaker, Mr. Bing Shao, who is the uh, P4P Director and Global Coordinator of World uh, Food Program. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Aibu. And uh, I'm very pleased and uh, to be at this uh, gender-balanced uh, uh, panel. And, uh, of course, I wish to thank the organizer, the CTA, the ACP, uh, as well as the uh, European Commission for inviting me to uh, to attend this very interesting briefing and uh, bringing together also looking at uh, a very a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, very happy to be representing the World Food Program here. I see you all, I mean, most of you know that the World Food Program is best known for its uh, humanitarian responses. It is actually the world's largest humanitarian agency. And every year, actually, we're assisting. For example, last year, we have assisted more than 90 million hungry people in the world in over 80, 80 countries. And uh, we deliver the, uh, the food needed uh, um, to the emergencies in some of the places where we hear every day. But also, we, all, we also work with uh, communities and development partners national governments, private sector, NGOs, to improve uh, uh, um, and, uh, uh, the nutrition outcome and then to build resilience when it comes to uh, uh, food systems, contributing to, to longer term uh, food security and sustainable development. And this is a great opportunity for us to share some uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, our programmatic initiatives uh, especially on the case of DRC, which is an emerging case, it's an evolving case in a little while. Uh, uh, as Mr. Ibu has uh, uh, introduced, actually I am in, uh, responsible of the uh, Purchase for Progress, the P4P program. But nowadays, uh, which has been actually an initiative aimed at linking smallholders to market, uh, WFP's demand, very uh, uh, upfront, but also the, the demand from other public sector, including, for example, the government's uh, grain reserve systems, school feeding programs, social protection network need, but also the private sector need. Uh, responsible of this uh, uh, program, but also now we are working more towards 
embracing or combining WFP's other smallholder initiatives to uh, engage ourselves in a so-called integrated programmatic approach to uh, deliver more systemic impact on food systems, on making food systems more inclusive uh, uh, and more profitable and more resilient also for smallholders. And um, we also think that in doing, in, in doing humanitarian work, we realize that food is not only saving lives, it is also a good tool for development as well as for peace building. So it encouraged us to work with partners to help uh, uh, people, displaced people, refugees, to go back to their villages, to engage in product, product, uh, productive activities, and to uh, settle their disputes over resources, like the ones that uh, our uh, colleagues have mentioned just now about taking the herds to another country across border, creating tension, for example. And uh, uh, we, uh, for example, we work, uh, we work very heavily with, uh, uh, with smallholders to, to strengthen their resilience, especially their resilience to shocks, to address the uh, f fragile situations, and improve their ac access to markets, enabling them to feed themselves, but also to feed their communities. Actually, under P4P, over, about over, over 2 million smallholders have been helped in more than 60 countries. We bought uh, 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 250 million dollars of worth uh, 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 of, uh, of food from smallholder farmers, mostly from uh, uh, through uh, farmers organizations and uh, uh, cooperatives. And uh, uh, this has actually proved to be a very effective way to uh, uh, encourage smallholders to uh, uh, in, engage in production, to increase, to invest in their uh, uh, agriculture production and livelihoods. Uh, we at WFP, we believe that a coherent approach, as I said, is an integrated and a coherent approach is required if we want to sustainably address the root causes of, uh, of crisis. Uh, we often go to the, find ourselves going back to the same country, maybe even the sun, same region of the same countries, to help the same people. So we say that this might not be the best way for us to invest all our efforts in. Of course, emergency response is definitely something that we prioritize. So uh, putting people first, of course, is essential to, to achieve this uh, zero hunger. It means that uh, we will work with local communities and other partners to strengthen local institution and structure, including their civil society and community-based organizations, and investing in their capacity, supporting their role as their first uh, uh, responders and collaborators of us. And we have a couple of uh, good examples in, in some of the uh, regions and countries where um, we are going to talk about today, including, for example, in South Sudan, we are providing life-saving emergencies, uh, supplies, for example, food, but also other supplies. For example, we engage in food in return for work to help the uh, smallholders to create uh, productive assets like uh, small irrigation facilities, little roads, that connect them to the main road, and uh, 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 to provide also uh, food for school meals, and uh, 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 to uh, help uh, uh, women and uh, also young children uh, to improve their uh, nutrition uh, levels. And in the Sahel region, which you know that is facing a um, very serious uh, humanitarian situation now, in five countries, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger, because of its uh, very mixed a combination of very negative factors, including climate change, including institutional livelihood uh, contacts, we're facing a, a, a hunger there, a famine there. So we are helping to address this early onset of lean season, which means a large shortage of food for about close to uh, uh, 6 million 
people in that uh, region this year. And uh, coming to the case of uh, DRC, which is a very, uh, as I said, is an emerging good case that we think has demonstrated the power, the effectiveness of this integrated approach, but also collaborations among different actors, including the RBA, the Rome-based agencies. And yeah, bringing to, to perspective the situation we're facing. For example, currently in DRC, we are having seven, more than seven, uh, more than seven million people in need of uh, food assistance. This is an increase of 30% as compared with last year. And of course, this hunger is largely uh, uh, caused by, uh, by, by human factor. Uh, we all know that that country, resource, in, resource rich, should have been able, I mean, to produce quite enough food for, for the whole population. And uh, of course, we realize, I mean, to bring about this, to bring uh, this, the potential, uh, to bring up this potential uh, of product production, longer term interventions and longer term support will be needed. So uh, FAO, WFP and IFA, the, Rome, the three Rome agencies, have launched a joint program to strengthen the resilience of the uh, fragile uh, the, uh, state, especially the vulnerable populations and households. And we aimed at, uh, of course, building inclusive and resilient food systems in the north and in the in the north and south Kivu province, so that smallholders' agriculture and financial capacities for for sustainable production and market engagement will enable them to increase their incomes, to increase their production, and then to uh, 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 build resilient livelihoods. And of course, we're also working to support community-based organizations, where we say, you know, women's uh, structure, women's chapters of. Uh, uh, farmers uh, organizations, uh, farmers cooperatives. But of course, we realize that, you know, farmers organizations, they're not the same. Their quality, which means the capacity of these farmers organizations or cooperatives will be critical if we want to rely, them, rely on them as partners to help smallholders. So that's why under P4P, we have also developed farmers organization assessment tools so that we understand, we, uh, we, we can identify the right partners. And of course, based on which we can design trainings to help these farmers organizations to you know, capacitate themselves to be the, uh, the viable partner that we expect them to be. So uh, this comprehensive program was designed actually to uh, combine rehabilitation of smallholder uh, families' livelihoods with the inclusive financing, market access, the peace building, in, in fact, also, uh, specifically by combining WFP's two main uh, smallholder-facing initiatives. That, that is what we call for, uh, food assistance for, for, uh, 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 for asset. Uh, that's asset creation, MP4P. In the short term, of course, how it works. How, how, it, how will it work? Well, it's with FFA, actually, the asset creation aimed at improving the food, nutrition, security of vulnerable households by providing immediate access to food in exchange, of course, for public work kind of uh, activities to uh, contribute to the uh, asset creation, as I mentioned just now. And then with P4P, designed and tailored to, uh, um, to, to encourage smallholders and to help smallholders to link to public and private markets, including WFP's own market, I mean, WFP's own demand. And this stable demand will help farmers earn more and then what is important that they'll be encouraged to invest in their own production. But investment are also encouraged from other uh, private sector and public sector uh, 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 actors. So uh, on, because we are of the uh, uh, 
conviction that only by placing, by helping smallholders in the value chain, enabling them being a, a, a partic real participant in the market, and they can be empowered and then incentivized to really create, to help create a, a, a food system that is sustainable and inclusive. And uh, this, of course, uh, uh, this approach is, of course, serving a good end in uh, strengthening the capacity of pharmaceutical organizations, as we have, uh, that has already been proved. And uh, uh, we're, also far, we're, we're also facilitating, through those farmers organizations, uh, uh, their access to seeds and tools, working with partners, especially on this aspect, rely on FAO, uh, so that we, um, we, are, we are getting the, the production side covered. In parallel, of course, we are also uh, 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 focused on the rehabilitation and expansion of market-oriented rural infrastructure to create conducive and enabling environment for smallholders. So uh, this program in DRC has been made possible through the very generous funding of uh, three, so far three major donors, the Swedish government, the Germans, as well as the Canadian government. I think it's over the total of about $50 million maybe, uh, uh, as I recall, uh, which is um, a very good support to us, to the RBAs, to implement such an integrated approach. Uh, in short, actually, we have learned in WFP and we have learned a good uh, uh, lessons and uh, knowledge in uh, how to deal, partly how to address these fragile situations in such as the ones in DRC. But of course, other countries uh, of similar context, uh, equally com complex, will require the same kind of uh, approach, but with different combination of uh, initiatives and interventions. And of course, I hope that this will continue to yield uh, knowledges and good cases so that we can draw, we can share in the coming years uh, at this forum, but also at our larger uh, 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 forums. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shao, for uh, explaining uh, WFP's integrated approach, uh, looking at uh, not only just emergency response, but also building resilience and uh, uh, facilitating access to markets, working with farmers' organizations, uh, and also the partnership with the other uh, UN agencies you know, working in this area. I'm sure there will be uh, lots of interest during the discussion, so we'll come back to some of those points. So the next presenter will be uh, Anik Sezebel. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. She'll be talking about farmers' organizations, social and economic force in the context of uh, chronic instability. I think she will be giving us experience from uh, Burundi. And she comes from this Confederation of Agricultural Producer Associations for Development. Anik. She will be speaking in French. Merci pour pour la parole. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'll be sharing the experience of my organization, CAPAD, as was just said, is an organization of agricultural producers which we created in, in a context of civil war in Burundi, that's the war in 1993, and because of that a lot of the populations had to move within the country, outside of the country, there were many displaced people. And therefore, there was uh, they lost access to the factors of production and access to land. Most of them were women. Most of the displaced persons were widows and uh, orphans who, who who were to take care of children. I was one of them. 
and uh, we all wanted to have access to the land so that we can feed and supply our various families. Well, my situation was more complicated. I was still going to secondary school. I had to take care of five children, and and all I had was emergency aid or to go back to the hills and uh, plant uh, food or maybe look for other options as a woman. Uh, so. There were some NGOs who believed in us and who supported us in in building up these organizations, and they supported the CAPAD initiative because we wanted to relaunch agricultural activities so that the displaced people could go back to the land without fear of being killed and prepare the land. They weren't going back to the land for revenge. They just wanted to go back so that everyone could live together. So the first things we did was to ho ho have discussions, draw lessons from the ethnic uh, war, assess the impact on agriculture farmers, how to manage this type of conflict, how to avoid it, and how to live together in peace. And gradually, we started uh, cultivating the fields, be, confidence was built, and when we started CAPAD in 2000, there were 25 of us. Today, it's a confederation which brings together 117 uh, agricult thousand agricultural households, households, many, and many of them are just small holdings with just one hectare of land to work on. And the actions of the activities of CAPAD today are directed, first of all, to the improvement and diversification of production. And as I said, most of the members of our confederation are small farmers who indulge in subsistence farming mainly and who have the main challenge of feeding their families. You've seen in the batch of documents that uh, Burundi has a very high level of malnutrition particularly for children under five years old. And that's because most of the families working in the countryside have problems of access to land or problems of access to means of production like seeds or, or funds or, or just uh, support for basic health care and education. So CAPAD, is trying to work with its partners and contribute to deal with this challenge so that our members can produce and, where possible, get a surplus. So we had to offer seeds. We, have to, we had to produce seeds for farmers. We had to help them access fundings so that they can deal with shock situations and then access to credit for those who were able to access credits. But we also developed systems of access through um, a caution system, mutual support. And in that way, there was access to credit for the poorest families. And gradually, for some families, they got an, an, a surplus, uh, a production surplus, and they had to see how they can take best advantage of the value added. So we talked about, we, we looked at various strategies. We would do uh, group marketing. We had a group marketing system. And we try to see how we can add more value and have competitive products on the markets. And and we had a small fund and we invested it in, in industrial equipment, which allowed us to take best advantage of the incomes of the farmers. So we, 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 we sell as collectives and 
And we even at one point had an access to P4P market and the domestic market of the main of the main suppliers. But we did have some difficulties now and then because very often small farmers don't have the means to wait for three months for being until they're paid. Sometimes we we realize that that certain markets are, are good for for comfortable farmers, but for the poorer farmers, it's difficult. So after 18 years of existence, one of the major successes of CAPAD was to contribute to a return to, pre to peace through social cohesion, which was built on the basis of mutual interest namely restore agricultural production and also the construction of a strong farmers organization in Burundi. Before the war, the organizations which existed were human rights organizations. It came up in 1992 when there was a multi-party system. There were no real rural organizations. In the 70s, we had state agricultural cooperatives, and this happened in other African countries. And and uh, it left a bitter taste in the mouths of the farmers. No one wanted to join this type of association anymore. So we had to start from scratch. We, we used community leaders to convince people we also worked with women who were the majority in the organization. They played a very instrumental role in trying in convincing people. One of the major another major success is the improvement of of production yields. So fifty percent increase from two thousand to two thousand and forty. We also created a lot of jobs, temporary and permanent jobs. We have a problem with statistics, so we don't actually know how many permanent jobs we've been able to create. But we also contributed to, so, to the socioeconomic development of youth and women and young men who were returnees, not from the interior, but from outside. Most of them were ex-soldiers, uh, former soldiers, and they wanted to go back to agriculture. And uh, it was at the request of UNDP. And, and those are some of the major success stories that we have. Now, what were the factors of success? I would like to say that the first factor of success was was because there was a failed state. It would fail in the agricultural sector. They had a pyramid system telling people what they had to grow. And 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 overnight, the, the, there was no state anymore. There was a vacuum created. So CAPAD and cooperative groupings came to fill that vacuum, fill the economic and social vacuum. But from the start, we decided to be neutral in, in politics. There were many organizations which were created, and they were easily m and quickly manipulated. And we resisted that shock because we decided on neutrality from the start. And from the and when there was the crisis in 2015, most of the civil society organizations working on human rights, well, well, the government uh, expel, expel them from Burundi. They weren't able to operate. So we were members of the of a major forum of the civil society organizations, but we were able to survive because. We were neutral, and we maintained that neutrality. Another factor of success is this dialogue that we installed, a constant, a, a regular dialogue to discuss conflicts, whether it be conflicts over land, 
or security issues, we've put a dialogue in place and that allows us to anticipate and develop strategies in this changing environment, whether it relates to security or econo economics or, or the social aspect. So quite quickly, the well, I've already mentioned opportunities, but there's another opportunity, and that is uh, the support we got from the NGOs who place trust in us, who helped us build our capacity. And here I would like to thank AgriTerra. They're here in the room today, the EU, of course, and the CTA, who have placed some trust in us and supported our programs. And they allowed us to work uh, for in a sustainable way because most of the projects were just uh, ad hoc projects and which were not sustainable. So CAPAT is did not only stay in isolation, we've developed partnerships with other organizations which allowed us to work at the national level to create an enabling environment. They've put legislation and policies which support agriculture. You need a little crisis like the one we had in 2015 for things to just go backwards. So we are always on the alert and we are trying to anticipate and propose strategies. One of the strategies, and this is where I will conclude, one of the strategies we developed was informal and formal advocacy fundraising. We keep in touch with the politics, with the political sector. In spite of the fragility of the government, we realize that government can play an important role, so we try to maintain that contact while still guarding our our neutrality. So we try to develop confidence and prudence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anik, for a fascinating presentation, really basing uh, from your own uh, life experience and how you transformed a very challenging situation into uh, something very promising and hopeful. And uh, I think through your presentation, we have seen uh, how really getting organized, uh, especially as a, uh, as a women uh, group and also as a farmers organization can make a difference, not only in terms of improving productivity, access to market, but also influencing policy at the national level. So I think it's an excellent example to hear from somebody who really has been through this process. So thank you for that. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Harma Radmaker. Uh, she's from Cordaid, program manager, and she'll be talking about disaster uh, risk reduction and resilience, the case of South Sudan. Good morning. Um, thank you for uh, inviting uh, Coordate uh, to this uh, interesting uh, event. Thank you to CTA and uh, the others. Um, I am a program manager in Cordit for disaster risk reduction and uh, resilience and looking after programs, among others, in the Horn of Africa. And here speaking on behalf of our uh, country office in South Sudan. Uh, we have uh, programs in South Sudan uh, since many years and an office in to since 2012 uh, doing uh, disaster risk reduction projects and uh, well since the conflict broke out in South Sudan in 2013 and again conflict broke out uh, 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 in the years after that we are also including conflict aspects in our disaster risk reduction and resilience programming here you see a, a small map of uh, South Sudan with uh, the yeah the the, the main hazards, floods and drought. You see floods in uh, in the north and in uh, along the Nile and in some other areas and droughts in the eastern areas, Equatoria's western uh, Bar El Ghazal. 
Uh, we uh, Cordit is working in a couple of these areas, Upper Nile, West of Bar El Ghazal, and in the in the Equatorian regions. Um, I have not included conflict. Conflict is also a hazard which can turn into a disaster easily, because conflicts in South Sudan change from locality to locality. There are different types of conflicts, localized conflicts, well, almost everywhere between communities, between pastoralists and farmers. And there is national conflict, civil war, um, not throughout the countries, but popping up everywhere and sometimes throughout the country. Um, well, recently in Upper Nile, we had a, a, a large conflict between the SPLA and the SPLA in opposition. Uh, uh, exactly, well, our one of our projects, an EU uh, relate an EU project, ProAct project, was very much affected by it. Uh, we just closed a program in southern. Uh, so, uh, we just closed a project on peace and uh, governance and development. And of these two projects, I will just tell two examples of what uh, we did and uh, how we addressed uh, conflict affected communities. Uh, in southern, uh, in, uh, in Equatoria, close to Juba, we were working with uh, f uh, communities, agro-pastoralists, two communities close to each other in conflict over natural resources um, because Cattle grazing on on the land of the neighboring community, uh, re resulting in fighting, resulting in cattle raiding, resulting in killings, armed youth, uh, sometimes even people were killed, revenge killings. So there was there was um, no productivity at all from agriculture and uh, livestock, while the, the the soil is very fertile, the, the resources are good basically. Water, land is good. We are working with local organizations a lot, with our own staff, but also with local partners, NGOs. <clears throat> and one of our partners um, in, in this program brought the communities together. They started talking, they started a dialogue, and they um, made an assessment of their own situation. They said, what are our hazards? What are the threats that are uh, threatening us? And of course, the conflict came on top of their list. So together, they had to make a, a, an action plan. What are the priorities? What do you want to address first? Uh, so they decided to come together to form a joint committee with youth, women, farmers from these two communities together. They started with a joint piece of land, and the, the NGO managed to uh, get them a 30 acres of land, and they started farming. The next step was building a warehouse where they could store their produce. Now they are so successful that they even have surplus production. They store the surplus in the warehouse. They, have, uh, they are able to... Uh, to, to market, and even traders from Uganda um, are buying their surplus. So this is one example how dialogue, working together, can restore uh, a distorted relationship between conflicting communities. Another example is from uh, <coughs> Upper Nile, where we are implementing our uh, uh, pro-act program funded by the EU. Here we work on community resilience and food security. Um, well, we started um, in 2016, um, but um, the project was basically slowed down, or you could say uh, more or less sus suspended when the conflict uh, between the, the warring parties, the civil war broke out in uh, early 2017. Many of the peoples had to flee. They became uh, internal displaced people. Some f of them fled also to Sudan. Um, they were host, they went to camps or 
yeah, had to uh, find a space uh, with host communities. Um, so we had to see how can we still continue to support these people because they are the people. We set up with them a program and all of a sudden we had to slow down, we had to stop. So what did we do? Um, we were able to uh, mobilize resources for humanitarian aid. Uh, we asked first, we asked also to our donor, what is the flexibility in the program to slow down and to uh, look uh, into ad adjusting our activities to human humanitarian assistance and go back as soon as possible into uh, a project uh, to, to, the, to the original program. But the flexibility is not that big. We were allowed to slow down and to resume the program as soon as possible to continue to pay our staff and well, and if, if needed to uh, extend the project with a couple of months and beyond the, 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 the contracted period. But we were not allowed to use money for supporting our beneficiaries who had become IDPs or supporting host communities where these IDPs were residing. So, but luckily we were able to uh, attract uh, humanitarian aid through a Dutch uh, public funding campaign. And um, we could help many of the people with uh, uh, cash transfers some were conditional cash transfers, but also people who didn't have anything were very vulnerable. We could also give them some unconditional cash transfers. Uh, people have started, to, well, the, the, in the meantime, the conflict is, uh, well, the situation is more stable, let's put it like that. Uh, people are returning to their villages, especially villages that are, again, controlled by the government. And now, uh, well, during this period, we have been able to help half of our target population with humanitarian interventions, uh, fishing kits, uh, etc. And now, uh, slowly, we, return, we uh, can resume our activities of the original program. So those are the two examples I would like to give of the program we do. And I would like also to tell a bit more about uh, our approach. Uh, so I'll, when we talk about uh, disasters, we always say, uh, well, it's uh, the intensity, strength of a hazards, disaster risk is, is determined by the, 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 the strength of a hazard, the force of a hazard. And the, in the, extent to, the extent that people are vulnerable in the sense of exposure to hazard, socioeconomic, physical, political, divided by their capacities. And especially the, 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 their capacities for us, that's the entry point. Building capacities of people who are vulnerable is the basis of our work. So when people become str stronger, get more knowledge, know how to uh, deal with disasters, prepare themselves, know how to respond, and also how to prevent a disaster, it increases the disaster risk. The same, we do not only work with the people, but also with local institutions and especially local government. We engage always the local government because it's important to buy their uh, support or to buy in, to get the buy-in of their support, sorry. <laughs> so that mean, it means that in this process on how we do things in our approach, we have rep replicable steps in resilience building. Uh, that means you do a participatory disaster risk as assessment, including, well, in, in cases of uh, conflict-affected areas, also a conflict anal analysis together with the people and stakeholders. You invite them to community meetings. You, invite, you have focus group discussions or whatever. You invite them. You try to engage them. Together, you make a joint action plan. Joint action plan is very important because it has elements, it has priorities of the communities. What do they want to work on? How do they want to work on their priorities uh, regarding disaster preparedness as well as development uh, aspects? And then we, then we work on 
establishing local structures within the community it can be a disaster risk committee. Okay, it can be a disaster risk uh, committee, a peace building committee, a, a water user committee, whatever. But we also try to get them linked to the local authorities. What kind of help can we expect from the local authorities? Um, and then, of course, this flexibility to adjust to changing situations. What, uh, well, the example I gave before, I think, was quite clear about how we think about this uh, flexibility. Um, and there we say then linking relief and uh, rehabilitation and development is a crisis modifier. We would like to put a lot of, like to stress this, how important this crisis modifier are. Uh, so I have only two minutes left, so I'm skipping all my, uh, why is it not continuing? Yes, this no, one. No, no. Yes. Yeah, it's it fine. It's, it's fine. It has worked, but it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, th thinking. So I, I gave a few examples. So I think uh, in we have achievements uh, with regard in this. Oh, now it's going too far. So I, I already gave a lot of uh, example of a few examples, and uh, well, the community groups and uh, they they achieve. Uh, uh, results in, in water, in agriculture, in community structures, and also in peace building. Um, so lessons from our programs from South Sudan, but also from other countries are that uh, communities own plans from uh, disaster risk assessments are crucial. We have to work with their priorities first. And these priorities, usually we start with, or they, it's, it's their priority, they start with tangible activities that give a result immediately so that we so that they believe in the approach so that um, and after that they also in this community structures they talk a lot with each other the peace dialogue which is mentioned already so we um, I think in, in well, when we talk about uh, processes you speak usually you say first we have to work on peace building and then on socio-economic activities. In this kind of programs we have shown it goes together. And socio-economic activities also are a platform for peace building. Um, yeah, and, and also with, with regard to, the, to linking relief and development, it's what is also said in the first form, it's not a linear, linear approach, it goes together and it goes from development to humanitarian aid and back. But this flexibility should be part of a program. Um, yeah, so that, um, and engage governments always try to engage local authorities or state authorities as uh, much as possible. Well, I would like to end with a few challenges. Uh, it's not easy to work in conflict uh, areas or conflict affected areas because, well, system structures are destroyed. Uh, sometimes people do not want, uh, even our, uh, well, also the communities cannot or work on their programs, on community ac action plans, and uh, because they have other things, uh, the other things to do, the situation is too dire, uh, they have to flee, whatever. Um, well, what we said, what I said, limited funding availability and focus on humanitarian aids, that's what we, uh, it's still, well, we do talk a lot about how to combine it, but the practice is still not uh, there. Uh, sometimes it's really difficult practical issues that you cannot access the areas you want to work in, where you want to support your target uh, beneficiaries, uh, you are uh, hampered by local procedures, very practical issue is inflation. Like in South Sudan, I think it's skyrocketing at the moment. And uh, yeah, and then of course, uh, working with different ethnic groups is also has its own challenges. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harma, for uh, uh, your presentation. Uh, highlighting the approach that CORDAID takes uh, in terms of uh, 
addressing humanitarian action and uh, development. Uh, I think a uh, really good emphasis on the need for dialogue, for joint action, and also on the flexibility side, especially from development partners, because situations in, in this uh, communities change very, very quickly. So uh, thank you for that. And our final presenter will be Catherine Downey. She is the head of Data Quality Assurance of M&E at World Vision, and she'll be talking about building re resilience to mitigate effects of future shocks in agriculture in the Somaliland, uh, in Somalia, actually. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start the presentation with um, uh, some results of a study that we've done which will then lead into um, how we are using those results to help with formulation of our strategy for phase two of our project. Um, just to give you a brief background, uh, SOMREP is a consortium of seven NGOs that has a large livelihoods program in Somalia. Um, we have uh, four donors, CEDA, uh, EU ECHO, SDC, DFAT, and USAID on and off, so five. Um, and we have been going since 2013. Um, phase one is finishing this year, and phase two, which we currently have funding for in bits, uh, will continue till about 2023. So far, we have uh, spent, we will have spent for phase one around $80 million and we are looking at um, about half that amount to continue going, and we will get money as it comes, which is generally the way. So what I'm going to start with is um, our, we, we did a study which looked at anecdotally identified positive deviants. So those households that were doing better than others, which were identified by beneficiaries themselves and also um, our program managers on the ground um, and uh, also other participants. So we wanted to look at why, what were the characteristics of these households, because if we're able to identify the characteristics, perhaps we can use that as a proxy for resilience as well. So. We, these are the areas that we did the positive deviant study. So you can see it's a reasonable breadth of uh, Southwest State, which is Dolo, Juba, uh, Jubaland, uh, Luke. And then we have Eel, which is in Puntland. And we have um, Badan and Eregavo, which span Puntland, Somaliland. And then we have Odwain in Somaliland. So it was a fairly comprehensive look at the entire country. Um, we looked at, we did a qualitative round first to talk through what a positive deviance household was and also to um, help identify those further. We then wanted to look at um, backing up this uh, identification with quantitative. And so we did a quantitative survey. We used both computer assisted and face-to-face um, -face as well. Um, now, the qualitative findings, um, basically, we were interested in looking at uh, the role of savings groups and um, what people use them for, because that seemed to be a commonality amongst all the participants. The most um, compelling quantitative finding was that the characteristics most closely associated with those people who were identified as having better food security and better capacity to cope were belonging to a savings group scheme and having access to early warning, early action information. So um, we also managed to find out a few other um, results as well, which were, as you can see on the slide, I won't bother going through. Um, but uh, they were associated with um, more, the more activities they pr pr um, participated in, the better off the households were. Now, just in terms of the findings of belonging to a VSLA, so that's a village savings and loans group, or having 
access to early and having access to early warning, early action information. We are going to continue to do further rounds of data collection for this study, both in the uh, what we would call the dry or lean season, but also in the harvest season to incorporate seasonality, because we want to try and collect panel data sets. And one of the things we're interested in looking at is whether or not belonging to a savings group scheme is important because of the function of the savings group scheme, in other words, access to informal financial instruments, or whether actually it's the function of belonging to a network that may actually have the positive effect. And the same thing holds true to er for early warning, early action information, because what we don't know so far is have they actually used that information uh, to implement strategies to mitigate the effects of drought. So those are a couple of things that we wanted to explore a bit further. So, um, sorry, this has now stopped working. Uh, there we are. There. Um, as I mentioned, a couple of other um, findings from the quantitative study. One thing I should mention as well is we, ha we use the impact outcome indicators of food consumption scores the a score on the household hunger scale and also for coping ability reduced negative coping strategies on the, R, the um, RCSI. These are not very good indicators, in, in my opinion, in the sense that they don't manifest change uh, at the scale that perhaps we're interested in looking at. So I am interested in exploring different types of indicators and I would love to collaborate with somebody else who has to do the same type of analysis. Mm. Continuing on, um, you can actually, one of the things that was compelling was obviously the higher level of education for, oops, for the, oh, the female head of household or the, at the level of a spouse head of household. Um, and these things, these are all the things that we want to explore further in uh, further data collection rounds. Now, one of the reasons we did this study was to validate our approach, was to see whether or not um, what we were doing was having its intended effect. And so we actually received validation that m one of the more important things we could do was to um, start off with that pathway of belonging to a, an, a mechanism which allowed access to informal financial instruments. And so we were gratified to see that ha that happened. Um, and so, as I mentioned, now I'm sorry this is a bit difficult to read, but this is basically our theory of change, which looks at building um, development plans with the community, then um, moving on to looking at informal financial instruments as safety nets, um, and then moving on further to looking at diversify, uh, div diversification of livelihood strategies, natural resource management, and eventually moving into the second phase, which now, hopefully, is going to be much more um, focused on agricultural livelihoods. So, as I was mentioning this this morning, we want to move into much more into looking at economic growth strategies through agriculture. But this is extremely difficult because um, we we don't have sort of much support in terms of donor engagement to actually put this into practice, largely because so Somalia is still categorized as in need of humanitarian assistance rather than development assistance. So this is one thing that we have to work on. Our strategy for doing this is very much, um, this is our, our theory of change for agricultural transformation. And the idea is that with the money that you receive for cash for work in an emergency situation, you then invest part of that in a village savings and loan. When you accumulate enough eventually, and when your community accumulates enough, you then move into formal financial instruments. And that opens up your lines of credit, et cetera. Also, these groups that have been formed at the levels of VSLAs hopefully will transition into cooperatives and organization and sort of a collective risk mitigation um, group that will allow particularly women and particularly will come up with opportunities for youth along the different value chains that are built around agricultural crops, etc. At the same time, you're going to 
um, the government, you're going to help them work on strategies to improve the, ina to improve the environment, to make an enabling regulatory environmental framework. And I will move on to the next slide, which really looks at employing a push-pull for inclusive market growth. And so you're looking at building the capacities of smallholder farmers to become competitive. So in other words, to compete in marketplaces which they might otherwise not be able to. At the same time, you're trying to work with government, private sector, etc., to create an enabling environment and expand the diversity and quality of opportunities. Um, and particularly, we're paying attention to women's economic empowerment and youth employment. So that's the philosophy behind it. Um, and these are some of the push strategies. So you seek to build the assets, you build their market readiness, you improve their negotiating, you create basically less risky points for households to enter the marketplace. And on the pull, pull side, you want, seek to lower the barriers for market entry and also to really look at um, building the middle section of the value chain because that's very much where the tertiary employment in the agricultural sector creates opportunities. Um, and very much this is where hopefully you engage the private sector. So these are the key features, systems approach, market demand driven, um, using sequencing, phasing, and layering. So you're basically trying to involve all sections of the value chain. And it requires a very good knowledge management um, system, which helps you constant, based on the evidence base that you create, informs your strategic direction. So you've got to have good data collection, you've got to have unique IDs for the beneficiaries or cooperative groups, etc., which is something NGOs don't invest in very well, but we're trying to. Um, and these are some of the interventions that um, would be on both sides of this push-pull strategy. Some of the challenges that um, we come up against are some that I already mentioned, but one of the big ones I found is that there isn't the technical capacity within the NGOs. And I was very gratified to see Cordaid's example on one of the slides of doing all of the work that we actually intend to do. So I'm going to talk to them about how we, how we get that. Because one of the big problems that we have is I'm an agricultural scientist by trade, and I come from the CGIAR system. I have worked with a lot of the different scientists in creating agricultural technologies, and I know of at least 10 that are on the shelf, for example, ready to be put into practice. I talked to one of my friends who's a seed breeder. He does some beautiful drought-tolerant, climate-smart seeds and legumes. We tried to put them into practice in Somalia, and we actually didn't even have the capacity to do good demo plots. So this sort of bridging of the gap, and this is what I'm going, this is what this slide is about, is, oh goodness, is bridging the gap between smallholders and agricultural technologies. We really have to look at ways for people to enter that space to broker. Because having worked with scientists, being a scientist myself, you don't come into contact with services, with organizations, with agencies, that can help you realize the impact of your creation. You'd, you don't often get an opportunity to test and trial, to look at will it go to scale. I mean, we're not going to have another green revolution where you know we're going to have impact achieved through scale, through uptake and adoption of a variety of technologies. And I think that we need to find that sort of mechanism that brings these two bodies of people together. So that's something I'd be very interested in talking about to, to donors and also to agencies, because I really feel that it's a space where the management of science, the brokering, the bringing together in partnerships is something that we could all work on together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for uh while well, sharing with us, you know, the outcomes of your study and uh, challenges that, you know, you have uh, gone through. I mean, especially, I, I think the last point you brought out in terms of uh, extending some of the technologies that are available in a crisis situation, because I think it came up earlier that 
agricultural development tends to focus a lot more on stable environments and not always in uh, in fragile situations. So I think that that's uh, quite critical. And if I remember, I think many years ago the CGR had a whole program for fragile state especially supplying improved seeds and, and so on. So I don't know if that's still active. Unfortunately, it may not be still, it may not be active anymore. But obviously all these interventions, I think they have to come together also in these crisis situations. So now uh, I think we have uh, had uh, excellent presentations from four of our speakers. So we're ready now to take uh, questions, comments, uh, for the next uh, maybe 15 20 minutes and we'll see how how this goes yes please merci et merci pour ces présentations intéressantes donc marie poznanski du csa i'm from csa um, in an agricultural network when you dealing with fragile states well, it's not only the government that's fragile, there's a lot of fragility in the other institutions and the civil society, but I don't think there's any other way to solve problems than by capacity building of the states and institutions and trying to see what exists and use that to start with. I don't know states like Somalia, which might be an extreme case, but in a country which is seen as difficult, like the DRC, there are very powerful organizations, uh, like the Kivu, they are strong organizations. However, a lot of people have taken the floor, and, and they, they represent major institutions, which are not fragile, you can't call them fragile. but. It's a very competitive market, that of emergency aid and intervention. And, and they have a lot of uh, communication uh, tools. So even when there are good ideas, there is some fragility in these organizations in, in, in getting them to work with the entry points of the so, of the civil society. Just let me give you one example because I don't know the other organizations very well. For example, the PAM in Kivu. Uh, P4P program is a good program. Everyone agrees on the objectives and all that was explained by Mr. Zhang. But as an institution, PAM is not P4P. They were specialized in emergency procurement. And it's difficult to get that working in this context. We realize that on the ground in the north and south of Kivu, very often, uh, teams don't miss an opportunity to work with a civil society. It, I might be very critical, but when you look at the difficulties that major organizations have to support f farmers' organizations, not just grassroots groups, but when these groups have become federations and provide services to its members, how do the institutions take that into consideration? I've noticed that in spite of all the goodwill from Rome and the P4P, it is still very difficult to do it on the ground for reasons of red tape and procedures. And it's the same for many NGOs. They, they replace local, local organizations and federations. So, those people who intervene, well, they do have to justify by showing good results so that they can get more funding for these fragile uh, populations. So how much progress have they made in, in working more closely with those people who are going to stay on the ground, whether it be government, civil society, or farmers' organizations? 
Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, let me go down there first. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Chair. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je suis Monsieur Barouti. I'm Monsieur Barouti. I'm a company lawyer, but I'm also involved in peace building. I don't have a question proper, but I do have some comments to make uh, on the presentations in the first session and the second session. First of all, regard what uh, Mrs. Sezibera said. She gave a presentation and showed how Kapad can, was able to restore peace in Burundi. And that was a very good thing. I'm from Congo, which is a neighboring state. I just wanted to inform Madam Anik and the CTA because this is what it's all about, that there is a railroad which leads from Mombasa, which they call the North Corridor, which was funded by the World Bank. It goes from Mombasa, it's going to cross Kenya, Uganda, part of Burundi and Rwanda, and it is going to end in Kizangani, in, the in my native town in the DRC. Well, the railroad has already been built up to Nairobi, and it's now cross, crossing Kenya. Once it becomes operational, it's going to open up the east part of Africa to the Indian Ocean, which is going to offer business opportunities. And, And it is also going to affect agricultural cooperatives like CAPAD. And Jean-Jacques uh, mentioned it when he talked about the agro the, the agro parks. So the authorities of the countries where the road where the railroad is going to pass, they have to start uh dealing with this situation to make sure that the small farmers uh, and protect support the small farmers so that they don't lose revenue now on the south sudan it's been see, it's been considered as a fragile state but the problem of the south sudan cannot be solved in isolation you have to look at what's happening in the north of Cameroon, north of Kenya, Democratic Republic of Congo. Once Juba doesn't, once Juba doesn't become a proper city with banks and offices and customs uh, departments, well, the situation in South situation will be maintained, and I even think it's being maintained by neighboring countries. My final comment to, to uh, was regarding. Um, my colleague from Senegal who talked about fragile states. Well, you measure fragility uh, on the basis of endemic conflicts, conflicts which continue over time and which we cannot solve for many reasons. It is true that there are many fragile states, but when you look at the World Bank definition, it relates to endemic conflicts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? If you can make them as brief as possible so that we can get more people to to say, yeah, for, and then first, James. Okay, mine is very brief for those who know about South Sudan, but particularly towards um, Mr. Bing Zhao, whose presentation and the work of World Food Program, I think it's very important. I'm just wondering, did WFP have a program in this region before the referendum and the independence of South Sudan? Because one of the things that's most extraordinary, and perhaps it follows on our, the, the last intervention, is that um, was the rush towards recognition of an independent South Sudan when all analyses would indicate that this was a huge uh, mistake. I mean, in other words, even 
the leaders, the political leaders of the past within South Sudan, like Garang, never were demanding independence. So I'm just wondering, because you see, when we're talking about fragility, then it, we have to consider what's the capacity in the various agencies that are intervening to understand these processes? And was there any discussion, any understanding uh, 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 of the, the various reasons why the very enthusiastic UN involvement, for instance, behind the referendum led to such a quick independence and a collapse of a state that never really was formed? Thank you, yes. Uh, Michel Lavollet, PPP Europe. I have two questions for Bing, one on data and the other one on partnerships. I suppose that an assumption for supporting commodity and market uh, in agriculture for rural communities is to have uh, real-time, reliable, and usable data. Catherine emphasized the point of uh, usable data being a determinant of capacity to address uh, <coughs> risk, risk, sorry. <coughs> so does uh, WFP have a strategy on data? And within that strategy, are you, for instance, collaborating with your index insurance uh, team? Because, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, they are producing quite a lot of data. Second question on partnership. You mentioned partnerships with private sector, but do you have a concept of partnership? Because in our long experience in projects with WFP, which was productive, it was actually very difficult to move beyond the rela uh, uh, payer-vendor relationship. So I think that's uh, a, a traditional limitation in being able to uh, develop more efficient partnerships uh, and sustainable partnerships with the private sector. Thank you, Michel. Any other question? Yes, right at the end, on the left. Um, well, thank you to the panelists. Um, I would like just to make a small comment to the World Bank, and it's a little bit to remind of the policy coherence that it's necessary. On one hand, you do great efforts to support rural communities, but on the other hand, on trade investments uh, that result in land grabbing, uh, like the, the Indian Ocean Food Basket Project now in Madagascar. So it's to look also at how can we effectively have coherence among the policies. But then my, my question is more for um, Anik, and it's about land rights and, and the experience that you had in Burundi. Um, could you give some examples of the strategies that you used for, with the communities to have access and secure land rights? Thank you. Thank you. Do I see any more hands? No. Okay, I think we'll go back to the panel to address these questions. I think lots of questions for uh, World Food Program uh, being, so maybe we start with you and then we'll go down the line. Yeah. Thank you for those comments and thank you for the questions. Uh, I hope I can answer a thing or two but uh, it is also relevant to the other, other panelists, which actually I found myself on the learning mode also very, uh, uh, yeah, very much so. Actually, I learned a lot, I mean, from the uh, presentations of fellow, of my fellow panelists who are uh, actually telling us um, cases and also experiences in the country uh, uh, level. Uh, I appreciate that opportunity. First, if I can attempt to uh, to answer uh, Michelle's question first on the reverse uh, uh, order. First on data and partnership. On data, of course, you know, uh, at WFP, we do have a, uh, I do not, I, 
I dare not say that if we have a data policy or, or a data strategy, but we do emphasize on yeah the 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 importance to recognize the importance of data in doing both humanitarian and uh, 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 development type of work in this triple nexus thing. So uh, on the base of the VAM work or the you know. We used to have a. We, we are still having a very, you know, very useful VAM uh, mm, uh, uh, vulnerability mapping kind of uh, data uh, uh, initiative, uh, which is guiding our programming as well as our operation work, as well as uh, uh, this, our internal scope system, which is also a data uh, tool to collect data. I mean mapping of our beneficiaries when we do our operation. For example, CBT, I mean, cash-based transfer, we do a lot. And uh, especially relevant is that actually we are increasingly recognizing the importance of data. And that's why we are undergoing a so-called digital transformation. We're attempting to undergo a um, uh, digital transformation. A part of it will be focusing on data. Hopefully, for example, when it comes to smallholders, we are trying to use the digital platform. It's on the, it's, we are conceiving. Uh, it's still at the very early stage of, of development, but to try to uh, emphasize on smallholder data registration and the issues related to it. For example, the shareability, the, the ability for them to talk to, to each other, even for WFP's internal, different internal programs and projects, we do not collect the same set of data because we focus on different aspects of those information. So we're talking about common set of it, and then, and then the add-on information that we may need. So this is a, this is an ongoing, and then this will going to be a very uh, uh, important need, and then it will be a, a, a thrust of WP in doing data. Partnership is the same thing, actually. The new executive director, David Bisley specifically said, of course, recently during the exec executive board last week, telling executive board members that uh, definitely private partnership will be a strong uh, uh, focus of his uh, uh, administration, if I can say that, his uh, term of mandate. Yeah, I agree with you in WFP as a uh, you know, fast uh, 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 reacting response kind of humanitarian agency, we focus on, you know, buying the food and then deliver it to the, to the people who need them in an effective way, you know, according to international procurement standards. So that's what you call pay and vendor kind of practice. So that's why even during the, the process of P4P's pilot, we found it tricky. The processes, the policy of procurement and procedures related to it were a little bit difficult to, to go by. So. Uh, but with this new emphasis of, uh, of partnership, hopefully WFP as it, uh, in general, but also smallholder initiatives in particular will benefit from this thrust of uh, emphasis on, on, on smallholders. So I want to say is that even during P4P's pilot, we managed to, to have uh, different kinds of partnership, many of them actually related to smallholders. I hope that answers part of your question, at least. And James, uh, your question has, I found a little bit too political, and I'm sure <laughs> Harma will be able to help me to some extent. I think it's about ten, eight years since the so-called referendum. I don't recall it because I'm not so politically loaded. And of course, definitely, uh, WFP was there, I'm sure, uh, because actually we were responding to to cause of uh, hunger and and humanitarian crisis. I, 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 I'm sure that WFP has not got itself into the trouble of uh, the referendum process, or also I hope. And uh, I cannot uh, really say anything about uh, the possible impact of those uh, the independents uh, had on, on, the, on the process, if you can excuse me for telling. I mean, it's a very truthful feeling of mine. <laughs> it comes back to, I think there's also a, a a question, or it's a challenge also from the um, floor, <laughs> about the missed opportunities of P4P. Yes, we, uh, we, I think three or four years ago, we developed a uh, document called Reflections on P4P. Of course, we tried to be very honest with us, 
And uh, there are things that we still, uh, we were, we did not really uh, 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 find all the solutions to, to some of the issues. Partly because of the fact that uh, uh, WFP traditionally as a humanitarian agency, when it goes to the area of development, dealing with smallholders, the root causes of hunger, we encounter some institutional internal kind of challenges. But I think the practice of P4P, the pilot of it, have helped us to think deeper through this issue. And so that's why I think WP, we have already started, uh, actually we've done some of the work already in making internal changes as well as in engaging new partnership to address some of those issues identified. For example, we realized that WP's demand in the first place is not sustainable in, in some cases and not always paid at the, uh, 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 the right time as uh, 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 Anika has uh, rightly pointed out. But we are trying also, for example, to use in innovative ways to address this, for example, by using ICT kind of uh, technologies, innovations. For example, we, we, we wrote out a, in Zambia a, a pilot, small pilot thing called Mano, which is a mobile phone based kind of app trying to do the job a little bit more efficient in linking um, smallholders to markets through, through, through pharma organizations. And uh, yeah, I think we will continue to, 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 to go along the line. And then, you know, based on those learnings, uh, uh, good and bad lessons, I think you find the South and uh, North Kivu project, which is being kicked out now, I think, will have a, will have a better knowledge to support, to improve the, uh, this one that we're going to, to, to see more result of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ming, for uh, well, giving us a fair detailed response on many of the questions raised. I will now ask uh, Harma if you want to make any comments. I think there are a few. Yeah, many comments have already been made. Um, so, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yes, many comments have already been made, and I think many questions are not really in my uh, area of uh, expertise. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there was a question about uh, general that NGOs or international NGOs replace um, local uh, NGOs or community-based organizations. Well, what, what I can say for Cordate, is that uh, we always work with uh, local organizations. Uh, we, when we implement programs ourselves, it's always together with local organizations. And in the field, it's local NGOs. Um, our approach is always uh, community-driven. That means that you that in our approach we build capacities of communities in, and in the end we say we facilitate. So we are not there <laughs> always. Our aim is to build capacities of people so that they can help themselves and we can leave. Uh, so so that, that's, that's in the approach and, and I'm sure this is uh, the ideal way of working and it's not always in practice there are differences of course the presence of being an international NGO also helps to attract funding so that we can work together with the local NGOs who are sometimes even though they are good and they have their reputation still well it's it's a pity to say it helps when they partner with an international NGO to attract funding um, yeah, and about uh, South Sudan, well, uh, uh, again, we are not a, a political organization and we work with the communities and before independence, uh, people were poor, uh, uh, there were many, many poor communities, uh, vulnerable communities we worked with and there still are and, well, the situation is, is even more dire, so we continue to do our work. Thank you, Herma Anik. Merci. Euh, merci. Euh, 
d'abord pour le commentaire par Thank you for the comments regarding the opportunities offered by the railroad that they are building. It offers opportunities, but it could be a major challenge as well for uh, small-scale agriculture in the Great Lakes region. And if our governments do not come up with better policies and gov proper governance and proper support for small farmers, I fully agree with you. But as was said, our states are fragile, so there are many things that need to be done. And even though there seems to be a calm in the region, we see that proper policies and the proper resources are not there to support our development because there are many countries which are under sanctions. For example, my country has been under sanctions, economic sanctions, since 2015. Now, to answer the question on the strategies that we've put in place to to guarantee a right of land to the members of CAFAD. Well, I need to mention two things, first of all. With the overall ceasefire agreements of 2005, uh, there's been a commission in, in Burundi to restore land to, to Burundian refugees it was not an easy exercise. It was brutal for some. There was dialogue for others. And we did contribute to that dialogue, particularly for, for land distribution or sharing the land from the people who are now using it and the previous owners. Uh, we are one of the high, the most highly dense populations in the world. So the solutions that we have opted for was to share the land with amongst families. Well, uh, we have a legal framework for that, but I'm not talking about people who stole land when they were in power. I'm talking about families who were given land and by the government at the time, who were also uh, sort of victims of the situation. So we contributed by providing a dialogue amongst previous owners and present owners, and that has worked. Now regarding land use, most of the land in Burundi hasn't been registered. The EU has launched uh, pilot projects to to register land, but that didn't help with that, with women's access to land, because land in Burundi is uh, is, is inherited on by by the sons. Well, we can't solve anything right away, so we're still working on that. We are continuing our dialogue on this uh, difficult land use problem. Oh, but there was a crisis in 2013 which made the situation worse. So agriculture has become very important and everyone wants to invest in land and, <clears throat> and push out the small farmers. So people who are not really involved in agriculture are investing in agriculture, and that's creating certain problems for the small farmers. So our, our, our way of dealing with things is through dialogue. And we've won several battles in that way, so we keep on holding discussions around these important topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. And uh, finally, I give the word to Downey. Yeah. Any comments you want to make? Yeah, I think um, just very quickly, um, <coughs> I'll speak to the um, 
idea of using local NGOs. In Somalia, there's something called the Grand Bargain, when one of the agenda items is the localization of um, of inter aid interventions, etc. However, I would like to stress, however, there are very, very few uh, local organizations which are capable, uh, have the capacity, and, and also a forum was held recently in Nairobi which brought together local actors and international NGOs, UN, etc., to discuss the grand bargain and that, that agenda and to really look at issues which were regarded as impediments, and accountability is the biggest one from both sides. You know, so the, the local actors very much feel that they perhaps are not getting what they should, and from the international actors, they feel very much that perhaps they're taking too big a risk. So there's very, it's, it's being worked through, but, um, you know, there are some impediments. I think Somalia is perhaps a, a, a a se severe case. Um, there was. All, I just wanted to highlight as well um, an example of of how difficult we find to we find it to uh, look at agricultural uh, improving uh, technologies that improve agriculture and to implement at scale. One example of this is there is a thermostable PPR vaccine, which is a les petits pestes ruminants, a vaccine for les petits pestes ruminants. Um, which could transform the livestock sector in Somalia. And this is a vaccine that's been developed by the International Livestock Research Institute. And it's, it's, the thermostability is of great value because it doesn't require a cold chain. However, and, and we took this idea to the Minister of Agriculture for Southwest State Somalia. He's tremendously interested. The problem is that under the CG centers, uh, under the CG countries of focus, rather, Somalia doesn't even feature. The same is true of uh, the priority countries under Feed the Future, let's say, an agricultural agenda for uh, USAID. So what that means is there is no money to trial and test the implementation of this vaccine anywhere. It means that we have to try and convince donors that this is a good idea. And it's very, and we're not an agricultural NGO. We don't have that type of expertise. And there is the reluctance on the side of the agricultural scientists. They're not particularly interested in, in doing this kind of thing. So when I talk about a real difficulty in, in marrying these two groups of actors to actually look at putting into practice an economic growth agenda, there are tremendous practical obstacles in our way. And I'm not quite sure how to resolve the situation. I think, first of all, the donors coming to an agreement that this is actually a landscape in which economic growth activities could take place would be of help. But also, I think there has to be a concerted effort by the powers that be to bring together scientists, research institutes, even if it's the, you know, the Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Institute has lots of technologies that would perhaps be of use in Somalia. But there needs to be that effort to actually bring together these actors, and NGOs are the perfect sort of playing ground for testing and trialing in the sense that they have projects in the absence of a very effective government that have a wide reach, and so you could get the potential for scale being addressed. Thank you very much. Uh, we have come to the end of our uh, panel's discussion. Well, it has been, as you'll agree with me, very rich with lots of uh, cases and examples. Uh, as we related from the first panel, of course, the whole issue of what do you mean by fragility, uh, where does development intervention come in, and especially uh, from the perspective of agriculture, you know, what, uh, what, what can be done. And of course, agriculture also as a vehicle uh, in terms of building, you know, organizing communities in terms of uh, farmers' organization, for example, and building trust and getting people back into communities and into their uh, livelihood. So there is a fairly complex uh, interaction of all these factors. Uh, and I think the last uh, point um, Downey raised in a way encapsulates a big challenge, you know, how do we bring development and emergency, you know, uh, together and how the different actors come together, you know, to bring about long-term sustainability and change. 
uh, and and I think uh, the partnership that we see uh, with different organizations, for example, WFP, and which is more of emergency, and then others like FAO, which is more long term, they provide a lot of uh, useful examples. The other big question is also working with local institutions, strengthening local institutions, and you know building uh, long term sustainability through uh, working with. Uh, in local government and, and other uh, players at that level. So a lot of uh, interesting questions have come up and uh, I hope some of the lessons that we have learned from the practical examples uh, in Burundi, uh, South Sudan and, and Somalia help us to have a better understanding of the challenges and opportunities that, that exist. So I'd like to thank all our speakers uh, for their excellent contributions and also the institutions that supported uh, us to organize this event, especially the NGOs, Cord Aid, World Vision, and CSA AgriCord. Uh, of course, our usual partners, you know, the uh, ACP and uh, uh, DEVCO, you know, from the European uh, Commission. We always appreciate the partnership, and, uh, you know, this is an event that brings some of these issues, hopefully, for policy and, and action as well. So uh, we normally summarize some of the outcomes of these discussions and all of the information is available on our website. All the background information, you can always uh, go back and refer to it. So our next briefing will be around mid-September and it will be on food safety, but we'll be sending you more details uh, on that. So unless there is something, Isolina, you want to address just that we have to leave the room because there is a meeting this afternoon and they will have to so uh, if you just move better to the to the lunch okay. area than staying here because they have to clean and uh, yeah so i just like to thank my colleagues isolina and uh, other cta colleagues also for putting this together thank you thank you